This is ethanol, and humans have utilized fermentation to produce it for thousands of years and have apparently been consuming it for millions. The concept of using yeast to convert plant sugars into alcohol is most widely known for its use on grapes, yielding wine, and barley, yielding beer, but has been applied to literally every consumable I could imagine. Somewhere around a couple thousand years ago, humans discovered distillation, which allowed for concentrating and purifying the results of plant fermentation into stronger forms that we know today as spirits. A typical liquor store might classify spirits into the following main groups. Vodka, gin, bourbon, whiskey, scotch, brandy, cognac, tequila, and rum. This is confusing because bourbon and scotch are both subcategories of whiskey, much as cognac is a subcategory of brandy. Vodka can be made from any of the other spirit groups, if you distill enough times. And gin is made from the post-processing of neutral spirit. And many spirit subgroups are excluded entirely. A more consistent approach would be to categorize distilled spirits by their base agricultural products, which would then yield four distinct main groups. Grain spirits, fruit spirits, agave spirits, and sugarcane spirits each with many nested subcategories. Some of these metaclasses, such as whiskey, have well-known and well-advertised constituents, while for others, such as sugarcane spirits, it is very notably much less the case. This group is most well-known for rum, which is made from fermented molasses, a byproduct of sugar production, but has many subgroups, such as rum agricole, cachaca, and batavia arak. Each of these categories has further divisions when considering country of origin, distillation style, aging, and more. Although all spirits in a particular sub-subgroup have the same fermentation source, there are still huge differences in the final taste. The interesting cause for these differences is the fact that distillation isn't a perfect separation of ethanol from all other molecules in the plant fermentation. Otherwise, everything would just taste like vodka. But instead, each distillery will reflect a rich palette of various organic molecules that are from the starting plant itself, byproducts of its fermentation, or from distillation and aging. The important ones to know are esters, ketones, and aldehydes. What this really means is that the world of rum is just a beautiful playground for organic chemistry. Complementing its complex chemistry are the cocktails most closely correlated with rum, tiki. These drinks are characterized by their unique and layered flavor composition and at times lengthy ingredient list, along with eye-catching presentations. Perhaps unsurprisingly, a world-level systems engineer who spent time dissecting the Windows operating system has turned his analytical skills to the worlds of rum and tiki. Increasing the access to and the comprehensibility of these amazing spaces. He operates a very insightful blog, has published a book, runs two great Instagram accounts, and has been appointed a WORSPA community envoy, the go between of the rum distilleries and the general public. He was also kind enough to spend some time talking in depth about these worlds. Our talk covers three sections discussions about Matt himself, about rum, and about cocktails. Each section can be viewed independently, if desired. You started out in college in physics and then worked in software for some number of decades. And could you talk me a little bit about, you know, kind of your whole path before you were a cocktail wonk? Sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, growing up, growing up, I just, you know, always wanted to be an astronomer or physicist or something like that, something science. I uh, always had that love of wanting to know how everything worked and, you know, take apart radios and all kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I went to college. I was also first thinking like, oh, I want to be an astronomer. And then the, an advisor said, yeah, there's like 30 jobs a year open up in that field. I'm like, okay, all right. Physics. And um, so I was um, uh, three, three fourths of the way through my physics degree and going like, oh, God, you know, I'm going to just going to be useful. I've got to get a PhD. <laughs> oh, that's going to be a lot of work. But I had luckily had like stumbled into software, um, you know, this going around, there was like a computational physics class and was using a, like an old 80 or a, a, a cheap IBM PS2 model 25 black and white. 
but like you know using like uh, Turbo Pascal to simulate like orbital mechanics that kind of stuff and I was like I really like this you know and then I found this book that was it was like Tom Hogan's PC reference guide or something but it was essentially like every every spec sheet every interrupt listing every IRQ level like everything having to do with PCs and like what is this and how do I use this and and anyhow, I sort of very, very rapidly fell down a programming, programming rabbit hole of like a systems programming type of stuff. Um, and, and sort of like at some point, like, I, why would I get a physics, you know, why would I go on and get a master's or bachelor's in physics when there's programming is right here and I love it. And I just happened to be very fortunate that uh, UCSC, where I was in college, um, right next to Scotts Valley um, in California, which is a company called Borland, which is now... Oh, I forget the name of it. Um, it's, it's now a different company. Um, surprised I forgot it. Anyhow, near Borland, I was able to get a job in technical support there, supporting first Turbo Basic, and then somehow being dumped. Guess what? Today you're now supporting Turbo Assembler, Turbo Debugger, which sort of let my system programming like, go into overdrive. <laughs> basically, random people would call up with questions about the assembler debugger, like, it's not working. And I had basically had to go, like, no, you're wrong. It's, this is, it is working as you. <clears throat> it's working the way it's intended. You're not understanding, you know. So I it was sort of, sort of like trial by fire to learn <laughs> everything about the PC architecture and debugging, um, and graduated at some point. Graduated from tech support into working for the uh, R&D department. Um, luckily, I found some very helpful people who sort of like sh you know, pushed me into working on debuggers. Um, this would have been circa 1990. To 1990, 1991. <clears throat> um, there was a big recession in 1993. Uh, got laid out, got laid off. Fortunately, uh, a gentleman named Andrew Schulman, uh, who had already written a book called Undocumented DOS, which was one of those sort of like seminal books of like going, going around what the vendors tell you, and here's what's really in there. Um, he, he asked me if I wanted to help him write a book called uh, Undocumented Windows, which I did. So uh, me and Andrew and another guy, uh, Dave Maxey, wrote Undocumented Windows, which sort of <clears throat> um, caused a big stir back in the time. You know, it was in the trade press and, you know, Microsoft is not happy that, that uh, you know, the, here's a book telling our secrets and explaining how the operating system works and undocumented APIs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and um, anyhow, it was laid off, but I had to help write this book just before. And so a company in New Hampshire called New Mega Technologies, which was... Uh, they went there, they got, uh, they basically uh, went, long story short, they no longer exist as a, as a company, but at the time it was sort of like the the brain trust or like the smartest people, it's very small company, the smartest people were doing things that nobody thought was possible uh, from them. Like uh, we, you know, they had soft for soft ice for DOS, soft ice for Windows, bounce checker, bounce checker for Windows. Um, I mean, it was sort of like this golden era of like software tools, like really coming into their own. And I was lucky to be sort of in the middle of it. And um, essentially was the, I guess, development lead for Bounce Checker for Windows. Um, and again, I bring this up just because this was everything about these products. There was like really no help from Microsoft in those days. It was sort of like... We want to figure out, like, this is not something, you know, not something Microsoft, you know, was going to help us with. All right, fine. We're going to reverse engineer, take things apart, you know, and I learned, you know, I learned, you know, I invented a technique called um, a detour, basically, or not detours, uh, IAT patching, basically learning, you know, learning how to, like, inject DLLs into processes and patch import tables to redirect. Like, I mean, it was just the geekiest low-level stuff, but it was, it was very much that era where I was just sort of like, if there's something I don't know, somebody knows it had to have been created. So let's go find it out. Um, and that, you know, that stuck me, you know, sticks with me today. Um, but it, yeah, anyhow, so I worked for New Mega and, you know, we won and, like all the awards, the PC magazine, it was a sort of golden era of, of software at that point, software tools. Um, 2003, 2004, I went to Microsoft. I uh, got to work in the Visual Studio team, later worked with um, what, what was a time called Red Dogs, now Microsoft Azure. Um, and after I left Microsoft in 2011 um, and went to 
a company called Skycap in Seattle, and it was basically like cloud computing as a, a you know like dynamic environments, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Great for like test configurations and stuff like that. It was sort of my first real experience with with um, like like distributed systems programming up to that point. I've been very very much focused on like the low level operating system tooling aspects. And so it's the first time I'm like, no, I'm calling other services. I'm calling the storage service. I'm calling a, you know, a, a UI service. You know, so it was, it was sort of like this brain opening experience for me. But by the time I left, left, um, Skytap in, um, uh, 2018, it had been 30 years for me, and I I had done it. I had seen and done lots of things, and I was just sort of like, okay, like I love the idea of software, but I feel like I'm even though it's a new problem space every time you're doing something that's never been done. It's still at the end of the day, it's the same thing. Like you know, make a make a design plan, execute it, you know, deal with bug reports, have debates over which bugs to prioritize first. You're still doing iteration. You're still doing, it's like the mechanics of it are the same, and I'm like. Uh, this is not really that same thrill anymore. Uh, fortunately, about um, seven years earlier, seven, eight years earlier, I sort of gotten into cocktails uh, and then rum. And, you know, and we can drill much deeper into that if you want. But basically, we're getting cocktails and rum. And Oh, and I forgot to tell you, um, back, back when I was, you know, uh, I did on non committed Windows, and then I later uh, wrote Windows Eternals, and then later wrote Windows 95 System Programming Secrets. So I had built into me this sort of like, I can write, I can do this, I can take on difficult topics that nobody else is going to write about, and just write about it, put it out there. And so, um, you know, when, when my sort of interest in programming was starting to wane, and, you know, my wife was always off traveling for business, and, you know, I was like, bored, what do I do with my time? And, my, and you know, I was like, Telling, you know, telling my wife, you know, telling Carrie, my wife, telling her, you know, that this, I learned this and this and this and got to go to this and still, I've got to travel, all this kind of stuff <clears throat> to sort of like feed my desire to know more and more and more about spirit. At some point, she's, you know, she's like, I love you, honey, but you need to go tell other people this, like, like, start writing again. So like, seriously, like, you have something to say, but I can't be the only person to tell and so and so yeah and so I had you know I had written before I had had a blog I had had I had written for Microsoft Systems Journal like this was just something that I had done for a number of years and then just sort of like set aside um, you know after sort of a, you know some personal crises or whatever in the early two thousand sort of like put that so writing sort of aside just to focus on you know getting through my job and so I sort of like put you know sort of like let writing go dormant but here you know 10 or so years later she's like start why don't you start writing again I'm like okay took, took time to figure out what do I want this to be like what what makes what I'm saying different from anybody else and from that idea was born cocktail walk a sort of like a sort of nerdy wonky approach to spirits and cocktails like the, they're you know they're very much related but you can examine cocktails in isolation and cocktail history you can examine spirits in, in isolation and in history and all those kind of things and it's literally everything fascinated me so i'm just sort of like cherry picking what do i want to write about what do i want to cover and and you know the more i learned it's like oh i have no idea about that let's go dig down there and write more and more articles and it just sort of grew until until the point where um by 2018, I was sort of like, why am I, you know, I'm going to work every day and I'm always thinking about what am I going to do when I get home? I mean, what if cocktail wonk, like, well, cocktail wonk was occupying more of my brain space. And, and again, we had some, you know, person, you know, life transitional changes happen and we're like, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do this. So, like, let's quit our jobs. My wife and I quit our respective jobs on the same day and jumped into the unknown. And for me, it was, it was the, having time to write uh, and to research and consult and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very long answer to, to a question, but uh, there's, there's 30, 30, 35 years I had to cover in there. So. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What drove your interest? Why spirits and cocktails compared to following sports or, you know, art or music? Do you know why sport, uh, spirits in particular? Yeah. I don't even, I can't really give you a great answer other than, than I liked it. Um, you know, it was never, it was never about the, the, like, I 
to get drunk. It was never never about like I like to drink it, you know, whatever. It was um, I, I had always just sort of been you know enticed by that notion of you know Polynesia and sort of you know the idea of tiki and escapism and, and that kind of stuff. And you know, and I'd always you know you know like once I had a mai tai and a United Airlines flight to Hawaii, and I'm like, okay, this is transcendent. I don't know what this is. But I want to know more. <laughs> and so it's a sort of thing that had lurked in me for a long time. But um, I just, I was in Seattle. It was like around 2007 or so. And I had a couple of friends and they were making some cocktails stuff. And I was like, you're actually paying attention to this. Like you're actually like squeezing, you know, I'm taking orange juice out of the refrigerator. You're, you're squeezing your orange juice and you have chilled glassware and, and all this kind of stuff. I was like, oh, okay. This is kind of fun. I enjoy the cocktail. And sort of, it was one of those things I didn't expect it to transform my life, but I just sort of tinkered around, tinkered around, and then at some point, you know, my obsessive need to to drill into everything interesting just sort of <laughs> off and went, and you know, and I just held on for the ride. So yeah, there's no, you know, there was no no bigger notion other than I liked it, and I just sort of, you know, the horses got away with it. So. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, I want to ask you a lot more about rum and tiki, but before I do that, I want it. So I have a surprise for you, not that big of a surprise, but um, I, I picked up one of your old books. Well, actually, I had the other one. I just forgot. oh lordy, <laughs> I just saw that the other day when I'm moving boxes around. Oh, that that's is, awesome. Yeah, that's, that's full metal. But believe it or not, believe it or not, that's not the largest book I've, I've written. <laughs> really, I, I only I was able to get that in the undocumented windows, and they were about yeah. the same. You know, comparable yeah. size. Um, yeah. I can see a lot of your your kind of like logical probing mechanisms that you follow here. I see that come up in your kind of cocktail long writings, which is right. interesting. It would be it's just, they're just it's just patterns and algorithms, and there's really there's really no magic. It's just like just just understand it, and then you know. <laughs> But yeah, I have a very sort of logical approach to things. So I think that you know maybe is what makes you special because it's I haven't found anyone that does it kind of quite the way that you do. But I wanted to ask you, I'm a pretty um, I'm a pretty standard Windows user these days. I you know basically just use it to run my programs, and I don't understand exactly um, why there's the need for people to do what you were doing back in the '90s of you know understanding what's going on in windows underneath the hood was this for like other programmers who were trying to write uh, programs that would run on top of windows yeah i mean it's i mean it's a, it's a great question uh what i would say is that at the time you know when i mean the functionality of windows or linux or pick your operating systems not even specific to windows but at the time like these operating systems were still Sort of in their, you know, if you, in their their big bang phase of, ex, of having exploded and going out, they were adding new features, new functionality at a rapid pace, and and you know sometimes the desire to add a add a new you know new feature <clears throat> or set of features <clears throat> capability outweighs the ability to sort of fully flesh out the features you have. Like it's sort of like what we have is good enough; it meets the the criteria. And we can either spend more time in the next iteration, add more functionality, features, and document it better, and more hooks and all kinds of stuff, or we can go build the next great capability. And so a lot of things we wanted to do just weren't weren't um, either well documented or weren't available. Like essentially, you know, the um, pretty example, like the ability the ability to, you know be in a running program and redirect calls to the operating system was non-existent or effectively non-existent until you know until i sort of came along and basically well at the end of the day like i understand it's going to look at an address in this in this memory location and go there i'm like well i can change that address uh, and so you know it was it was never it was it was never it was it was more a matter of I, I need to get from here to there, and if you're not providing me a well-documented path from here to there, I'm gonna go build the road myself. That's sort of that's sort of what drove that, you know. And like I said, the, the 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 documentation wasn't as good then. It wasn't, you know, there was it was just like I said we like they had sort of like built the the structure of a city, but not really all the amenities that we would later. 
greater need. So, so it's a, it's a very short answer to a very detailed question. Yeah, I'm sure. I think I got a flavor of it a few years ago. Um, Windows was in the process of developing their Windows subsystem for Linux, um, which lets for anyone who, who might watch us and not know it basically lets you run Linux alongside Windows in some technical way that I don't exactly understand. I think it uses Hyper Hyper V, which you I think might have had some work with. Yeah, I did. I did work on Hyper V at, at Microsoft. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so back in like 2016, 2017, there was like a really shady, like around the back way that you could do this because it was a beta feature and there was a lot of, you know, shifting through post on Stack Exchange on how to do it. And now it's included in the Microsoft Store, so it's pretty standard. But um, I imagine that was kind of just the way everything worked back in the yeah. 90s. I mean, that, I, mean, just, I mean, just the fact right there now, the fact that like Stack Exchange exists, like these, you know, if, we're going back to 1995, 96. It was like CompuServe forums or mailing list. Um, I mean, yeah, just just the, the infrastructure that programmers have now is just like wildly better than it was 20 or 25 years ago. So, you know, it's just which is great, but also sort of like you know, like like I I did it the hard way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um I don't know where I'd be without Stack Exchange, Google, like. I've yeah. been able to get through no, college. Cool. Like literally, there was nothing. It was sort of like if I don't figure it out, you know, I can't go to Google. Like, oh, this is what's going to happen. No, I'm I'm literally going to sit there and, and soft ice debugger and step through the operating system code till I understand it. You just do whatever it is necessary to get the information you need. I w I'm barely old enough to kind of remember having to go to the library with my dad to look things up in the encyclopedia to learn things, um, but. You know, that just seems like a distant, distant memory now. Um, so one other kind of life question that might be useful is, are there any kind of main ideas? So a lot of people that, you know, might watch this are, you know, college age or so. Are there any broad ideas or concepts that you found useful for your life that, you know, if you were, you know, 18 20, 25, again, you would really recommend someone to learn, such as, you know, coding or calculus or writing? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's just the two things that come to mind are, are you know, A, usually there's an, you know, A, number one, usually there's an answer out there and you may have to dig, you may have to dig to find it may not be on the first page results of, of your Google search of Google searches. Um, you know, learn how to dig, learn how to, you know, critically think and and question everything and all that kind of stuff. Sort of obvious stuff. Um, and the other the other sort of one that that, you know, you know, in terms of coding, but even more life in general, is there's often times where you're like there's a little like a little rock in the road or something that like you know this is something i'm doing over and over again every day i'm doing something along these lines and there's some nuisance and you're like okay i'm just gonna work around it i'm gonna like i'm gonna like not not stop and move the rock or fix fix the problem i'm just gonna work around it because i don't want to invest the time to do that when i think i'm not going to be doing that for much longer and what i've learned over and over again is is, is just, just sometimes stop, fix the little thing that's getting in, that's getting in your way. You may think it's a small thing and that you don't need to fix it, but, you know, at the end of the day, fixing those little things that are impeding your progress are, are uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, end up saving you enormous amounts of time. I mean, just, you know, like a modern current example for me is like, you know, something with like a spreadsheet. I'm like, oh, I need to like figure out how to like add... Uh, add value two to a hundred numbers in this column. And I'm like, I can either like, you know, I have to go learn the function and go dig around in Excel and learn how to do that like in an automated way, or I can just go do it manually. Like it's sort of like, it's faster in the short term, just go, I'm just gonna go do it myself, you know, add two. Yeah. <laughs> no, you tell yourself, nope, stop, do the work. That learning experience is like, like oh, okay. You're forced me to learn a function or learn a te technique, whatever is actually valuable and actually made me much more efficient um, going forward. So yeah, I don't I don't know how valuable that is, but that that's you know sort of like the wisdom of, of 
like 30, 30 or 40 years in computers. So I know I, I oftentimes find myself in that exact situation of I can spend, you know, the time to do this once correctly, or I can just do and it'll take longer, but like, like what's the long-term payout? And I've already gotten to the point that usually the answer is just take the time to do it once correctly, and then you can just automate it for the future. Um, but I, I, I'm not totally there on the wisdom yet. So hopefully as the years come by, you know, it's um, even stuff like, like unit tests, like, uh, I was never a fan of unit tests early on, but when I finally sort of embraced them, I'm like, okay, I just fixed this incredibly dumb bug that should probably never come up again. But, you know, I'm supposed to not submit a fix without writing a unit test to test for that case. And I'm like, ah, this is dumb. Why am I writing a unit case? For this? Like, Doesn't matter. Sometimes they will still save your butt when you <laughs> some later yeah, point. That's out, a good well, piece of advice. Yeah. yeah no, just just, just not go down and do the damn, damn unit test as, as innate as you think they are sometimes, you know? Yeah. And, you know, you know I, I, funny, like I had this sort of conversation with my wife about, about, um, you know, she's laying out a book and like in her approach to like making out, laying out a book and basically change tracking. Like, you know, at the end of the day, if you think about it, like laying out a book and writing code are sort of similar, like this is, it's this iterative process. You're doing things, whatever. And at the end of the day, there's still change tracking and who's editing and, and how, and, you know, ended up having this sort of deep under, you know, thought understanding of like, oh, like, your mindset is very much not something of like, like you, like you want to, you want to track everything in the stream detail um, and, and make all the big changes at once rather than like make small, lots of little small incremental changes. And she's like, and she's like small incremental changes, you know, introduce more and more uh, opportunity for error. And I'm like, but yes, but in the coding world, we're like, we have unit tests. So like we can make a small incremental change and it's basically free to find out if we screwed up something. So, you know, sort of, you know, you know, it's not just coding, um, but you know, yeah, in, in, invest time to do it right. So, yeah, I think that's really great. Um, okay. Uh, I think I got the broader stuff out of the way and I'm finally able to, I, I'm so excited to be able to ask you this. Can you please tell me what is rum and how is it different from other spirits? Sure. Um, I get, I get asked this a lot. <laughs> I am aware. <laughs> the, the short answer is that, well, actually I back up. Um, uh, it's something I wrote recently. Basically, if you think about distilled spirits, if you think about those words, um, what are they? Like distilled, basically boiled, you know, boiled down to their essence and the, the, the spirit of something. And, and is, is essentially is distilled essence of something. And, and all distilled spirits are basically taking the essence of some agricultural product. Um, if it's grains, you're taking the essence of, of, of a barley or wheat or what have rye or whatever, you're taking the essence of that. And you are distilling down the essence of barley and rye. And, barley or wheat or rye or whatever. And those are, those are whiskeys. And same with fruit. If you take, you know, mostly grapes, but also, you know, works with apples or other, other fruits. If you take those fruits and you distill them down to, to their essence, you have brandies. So brandies are made from fruit. And, you know, and if you taste a good, like Peruvian Pisco, you'll drink it and go like, this is grapes. Like I taste the grapes. It just jumps out vibrantly. This is concentrated grape. <clears throat> and so in terms of rum or you know, broader category, you know, broader category is a is a cane spirit, it is a spirit made from sugar cane. And um, rum is rum is what we, you know, is what most people call it, but there are other other types of, of cane sugar cane spirits and i and i delineate them sugar cane not sugar i would say sugar cane um the tall grass not the beets not sugar from other sources but it's the still essence of the sugar cane plant from which we get things like rum and clarin and and grog and cachaca and all this whole category of, of sugar cane spirits um so yes it's, it's a fun at the end of the day it's um and i've written about this it's your your agricultural product you start with that defines what type of spirit you're making be it be it agave spirits or sugar cane spirits or whiskeys or 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 um brandies and that for the most part 
those are the only real big categories of spirits. You know, and there's like weird things explained around vodka or other things. But at the end of the day, those are the primary things, the primary four types of agricultural commodities that we call distilled spirits. So to ask you a naive question, my understanding of the way that making a spirit works is you get something that has sugar in it, um, you ferment it, which means that that sugar gets digested by yeast into um, eth ethanol, ethyl alcohol, and then you heat it up so that you can separate out basically the alcohol from the rest of whatever's in there. The, so the naive question is, why does it matter if you start with sugar cane or you start with sugar beets or you start with some other sugar? I mean, you're just ending up with ethyl alcohol at the end of the day. So why does it matter the source? Uh, great question. And what you provided there is accurate, but it is actually an oversimplification in that um, if you think about it, you're just, you're, if you think about your distilled spirit, um, it's, it has a lot of water, 40% water or 60% water, whatever, whatever amount of water is in there, whatever amount of, out, of ethanol is in there. Um, but those two things are essentially tasteless by themselves. Water has no intrinsic flavor. Uh, ethanol has essentially no intrinsic flavor. But if you drink a funky Jamaican rum, what is, what is all that, where's all that intense flavor coming from? And it's coming from this very small percentage of things which are not alcohol or not water. So it's sort of like the, the outlier, these little fringe things on the edge that are actually the important, the important flavor compounds. And so, you know, and that concept goes all the way back to your, your original source material. It's like, yes, sugar cane and sugar beet, they both have sucrose molecules and glucose molecules and and um, sucrose, glucose, fructose molecules in there. And given yeast, they will create, they will create ethanol and other types of alcohols. But it's those other things, the things on the margins that are, are what's actually really important for distinguishing one type of spirit from another. If you actually look at the, at the, um, there, and there are like PhD papers on this, like, uh, contents of sugar cane, you'll see there's waxes and, and other organic materials. And it's these other organic materials, these things that aren't just the sugar and the water, these other materials that in turn influence the yeast. And, and those, and the yeast and influence the yeast and it makes, and when the yeast make, yes, yeast makes ethanol, but it also makes methanol. Which you don't want, and then makes like other types of alcohols. Uh, fermentation makes other types of alcohols, and it's those other types of alcohols that, in very small quantities, that are actually part of the flavor. Um, and and again, the 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 ratio, uh, the types of organic materials that are in your starting in your starting point also influ influence the ratio of esters uh, you know, of esters that are in the final. Uh, outcome of the fermentation process. So is there like, like I said, yes, the mainline process is about taking sugar and having yeast and making alcohol, but that's really just sort of like the carrier. <laughs> that's, that's sort of like, that's, that's like the least interesting. It's, it's conceptually the most valuable part is the alcohol, but it's actually, it's sort of like the carrier for which all the other smaller things on the fringes sort of ride along. And it's those differences between, you know, the other, you know, the organic compounds you're going to find in sugarcane juice versus beet juice that are going to, you know, are fundamentally what differentiates sugarcane juice as rum versus beet juice, which would be beet spirit or something like that. Right. Okay. And just to get into the chemistry a little bit, I'll, I'll probably try and put a small introduction to our talk, you know, just mentioning some of the chemistry concepts, but just to say it here again, um, and I'll put something you know, a visual on here for anyone that's watching this, but, um, there's, al there's the alcohols, which, or there's ethyl alcohol, which is what people mean when they say alcohol. And then there's kind of heavier alcohols. There's esters, um, which is just a one type of organic molecule. And I understand that aldehydes also play some role, um, is there any other group that's important? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, es ester, ester, higher, higher alcohols, esters, aldehydes. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. There, there are several more um, that I'm 
I was reading an old article from like the early 1900s and it was talking about ethers. Um, and I'm not sure if that was just, I think that they might have meant esters because there was yeah, some name. That was just what they called it. Yeah, it was essentially just what they called it at the time. There's an article on my website that, that actually um, uh, sort of breaks down the key, the key Whoa. sort of like organic compound. Actually, if you have a minimalist tiki, you know that chart yeah. of the esters in there? Uh, that same guy, the same guy who did that actually did a whole other, a whole other bigger chart, which is sort of like esters are just one part of it. It has other, other things. Those ones are popping, but yeah, but it's, it's like the things like, um, like, uh, Guayacol and things like that. Those are also a whole other group. Uh, something I've written, but not yet published has, goes into this into extreme detail. So, but yeah, basically. Yeah, basically, if you know, if you look at the at the field of organic chemistry, if you look at the major groupings of compounds, odds are a lot of them you find a lot of them in rock. And there's that, and there are actually good papers out there. Uh, I think one here written here in Louisiana about uh, ten or twenty years ago that basically does like a chemical breakdown of typical rums and go to list. Here's so much of this, and here's so much of this, and here's so much of this. It's actually it's a, it's an interesting reading. Yeah, I was in. Um my organic chemistry lab back in undergrad and there was a lab where you're supposed to synthesize an, an ester and you synthesize it and it was the coolest thing because when you do i think it ended up smelling like strawberries or raspberries i think strawberries right. and i was like wow this is really cool of course in a chemistry lab you can't taste anything but it's like mm -hmm. wow i just made you, you take two nasty smelling chemicals and mm -hmm. you combine them and it smells like fruit it's amazing and the thing that was really interesting to me about rum is like that is organic chemistry, mm -hmm. the most incredible thing. Um, like everyone always complains about, you know, you're in, you're in class and like, oh, like when the hell am I ever going to use this? You know, it's like rum, like that's like, it's like the perfect, like it's the most exciting case. Exactly. So since we've gotten a little bit into the chemistry, I wanted to ask you some questions. So I've always liked rum, my family, like even when I was like five or six years old, the rum taffies, the rum flavored, uh, like saltwater taffies on Cape Cod, those are always my favorite by, by far. A few years ago, I got a bottle of Smith and Cross, which is, I don't know, I certainly see it online as, you know, kind of the inter what is the introduction for funk for a lot of people. Right. Could you tell me what uh, funkiness or hogo means when it comes to rum? Yeah. Yeah. This this question comes up a lot as well. Um, uh, funk, hogo, uh, et cetera, it's called other things. This is essentially, um, they're, they're, they're sort of, they're sort of like a writery, writery sort of, um, sort of like flowery description of it. Very, you know, you know, wonderfully, you know, you know, whatever, but, you know, contempt at a technical level, it is essentially, it's a set of organic compounds that, you know, we particularly associate with, with, um, Jamaican rum that, you know, it's, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those things of like, once you, you don't know it, you can't describe it once you have to experience it. And then once you experience it, you're like, I, there was, I said this in an imbibe article interview with me. It was essentially like, it's like a, the moment you smell it, it hits the back of your brain. You're like, Oh, this is it. This is what rum is supposed to be. Now I understand what exactly. rum is supposed to be. <clears throat> I understand like this is something unlike anything I've ever, I've ever heard before. And, you know, and, and sometimes it's described as like, but now, you know, overripe banana and these sort of like happy terms. And I've, I've also heard it described as like, you know, the, the smell of an old dumpster behind Wendy's or whatever. Like there's it's far more pleasant, you know, than there that. is yes. a really fine line between, between like, okay. And is this dangerous type of thing? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, right. it's, it's not what I would call earthy. It's not, you know, not like eating dirt or anything like that. It's just a sort of like, like, uh, nature and fruits and bananas just sort of are left alone. And it's sort of, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's, it's impossible to describe, but technically, um, is essentially um, various esters and various um, higher alcohols and I think some aldehydes. It's just you said like all distilled spirits have, you know, they are basically stews of different organic compounds. Uh, 
but the flavor of whiskey is different from the flavor of Jamaican rum because uh, usually the similar compounds are the same, mostly the same compounds, but in different ratios. So, you know, you know, you might find little elements of Jamaican funk in a bourbon, but they're going to be in such small quantity that we don't, we don't notice them. It's just, it's, as I said, it's like, if you think, if you think of like the spectrum of, of different organic compounds, different types of esters and higher alcohols and aldehydes, and if you think of them, each is like on the graphic equalizer, you could do like adjust and what are the relative intensities of each of them and, and, you know, you know, that, uh, you know, if you got granular enough, you could essentially custom tailor any spirit to taste however you'd like it to, if we had the resolution and ability to do that. But yeah, this is where like Jamaican rum has there are certain organic compounds that are that are um, elevated to higher levels than flavors we don't associate with, with Jamaican funk. Sure. So Jamaican rum is particularly known for this kind of flavor profile. What do they do differently in their distillation process to get this particular flavor? So um, the the short answer is uh, they basically is essentially a, a much more elaborate and longer fermentation. Um, you know, a typical, like a, like a typical fermentation for like a Cardi or, or some like a relatively light rum. You can do in like 24 hours. It's like you take molasses, dilute it, add yeast, 24 hours later, you have 8% alcohol, go. <clears throat> but um, that, that, that fermented wash you're going to get from them is going to have, uh, you know, a lot of alcohol, a relatively high amount of alcohol, but relatively little other congeners. And it's these congeners that are flavor compounds that we're going to concentrate in distilling. Now, if you want more congeners, more flavor, it helps if you let the fermentation go a little slower, uh, maybe sacrifice a little of the, of the alcohol level in exchange for more flavor. Is they let more of the alcohol is produced to create more esters. Um, so, I mean, you can certainly get a more flavorful rum just by, you know, choosing a yeast variety and controlling temperatures and whatever such that it runs a little longer. That's sort of baseline. Um, then you can further supercharge fermentation with techniques like uh, dunder, which is essentially just a stillage. Um, same thing as sour mash whiskey. Basically, take the acidic, slightly acidic wash that's or slightly acidic what's left in the still after distillation and you use that as part of your source water basically by adding by adding acids uh to your fermentation you can essentially create more opportunity for esters to form so dunder is dunder is one way they do that um, another way might be um, cane acid which is literally taking like in jamaica taking the juice of maybe like bad canes or cane juice you get to use or whatever and basically letting it sit in a tank with cane stocks and basically turn into vinegar basically uh using that as part of your of your um uh, mash recipe um and so you can certainly get get um higher funkier flavors with with you know with dunder cane acid and maybe picking a particular yeast strain and you know, and I'd say an example like Worthy Park, they have pretty funky, interesting rums that use just those basic techniques of finding, um, you know, of, uh, uh, actually, they don't, I don't think they use thunder, but, but basically uh, using, you know, ch choosing the right fermentation yeast, you know, basically growing their own fermentation yeast. You can create, basically what I'm saying is that you can create a fairly funky rum without doing anything too exotic. Now, if you want to get into the really crazy stuff, you know, like Hampton Estate, um, you would have to get into muck, which is where, which is what everybody thinks thunder is, but muck, muck is the, is the weird, like, bio warfare levels of, of bacteria or whatever. Um, and basically, if you can use muck, and there's basically three distilleries that we know use muck, as essentially, you let your normal fermentation go it maybe takes two weeks let that go do its thing and then you basically put in like a dose of this muck and essentially this bacterial load sort of like re-energizes and causes more 
additional organic compounds, you know, flavor compounds, congeners to form, and in particular flavor uh, favoring um, higher alcohols and longer chained uh, esters. Basically, the more the more complex the more complex the alcohol molecules and the acid molecules, the more complex the esters are that form from those things. So muck is essentially a way of like, you know, sort of like it's not restarting the fermentation, but like taking the results of a of a normal fermentation and basically like supercharging it to create even more congeners. So those are the big, as I understand it, those are the big three techniques for creating, you know, these sort of weird Jamaican washes. And and I don't know about muck usage, but I know, you know, those techniques of like dunder and things like that. Those are you'll you'll see those elsewhere. Um, they're not exclusive to Jamaica. Uh, go to Martinique, uh, Lake Alion, the Grand Rome. Uh, looks very, you know, it's kind of similar to a, to a, you know, using dunder and things like that. And they also create a, a rum that some people might think is a Jamaican rum. So, um, so just a couple terms. When you say congeners, this is kind of organic molecules that are the precursors to the flavorful esters and aldehydes. Is that right? Not exactly. When I say congener, um, the it's funny because different people have used congeners differently. Uh, but the the way people who are very who are way smarter in this than I am describe it is congeners are essentially anything other than water and the ethyl alcohol. So basically, congeners in some contexts would mean like something bad, something you don't want. Like if you're trying to make completely pure alcohol, anything that's not you know, ethyl alcohol or whatever you're trying to make. And then it's not that, it's like a congener. It's sort of like it's an impurity. Um, you know, in the case of distilled spirits, it's those congeners, it's those impurities that are giving you the flavor. Like you said, the water's not giving you flavor. The ethanol's not giving you flavor. All that flavor is coming from these impurities. And those impurities are, again, higher acid or, or alcohol, high, uh, other types of alcohols, acids, um, aldehydes, esters, again, it's all a stew of different organic compounds. Um, so technically, my understanding is that the esters are the impurities, if you will, that exist after um, fermentation ends. Um, those are distinct from the impurities you might find in a spirit after aging. Like, for example, wood extracts. So after you age, you know, parts of the wood are going to go into spirit. Uh, they are also organic compounds, but some people would say they're not congeners because they weren't put in there by fermentation. So, like I said, I, I, you know, one of the things that I've been talking about lately is the distinction between called the fermentation forward rums and aging forward rums. And there are rums that can be both, but I'm saying if you, if you, you know, if you took the Jamaican rum wash, distilled it, you get a rum fire, okay, right? and if you, and that's incredibly flavorful. Like, just clearly, these flavors existed without any aging. Um, then if you took, a, took um, say, like, aguardiente, um, you know, a, a Spanish heritage fermentation that had gone for a day, distilled to, say, 70 or 80 percent alcohol, and tasted it, it would be it would have some flavor to it, but it's not going to have Jamaican rum level of flavor in it. So, so uh, I said some rums are fermentation forward flavors, and other ones like, especially like the Cubans and Puerto Ricans, more of that flavor derives from the aging process rather than the fermentation process. So that's sort of one way I kind of like differentiate rums of that. So, but yes, con congeners in theory are the things that came out of the fermentation process. Got it. Okay. And then back to this idea of muck, where does this muck come from? So muck is sort of like um, the closest analogy I can think of is sort of like your, your starter yeast. It's not actually a yeast, but you know, at home, like we have this thing that we keep alive and we occasionally feed it and then, you know, keep it, you know, give it nutrients or keep it alive. And when we need some of it, we take it out and we, and we put it in whatever we're making. <clears throat> so, in um, in Jamaican distilleries, essentially they have this thing called a muck pit, and and periodically they will put. Um, sometimes it's it's um, I said it's a muck pit. It's it's a thick, very thick liquid, basically or goo, if you will, um, 
filled with bacteria, all sorts of crazy bacteria. And they occasionally, I guess, feed it with um, dunder, some of the little bits of dunder, maybe um, cane juice that they've run over some fruit to pick up some various bacteria. Um, this, these, 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 the exact feeding of the muck is sort of like those deep dark secrets that even I can't extract from the from the people who know. It's sort of like every distillery has who has a muck pit has their way of maintaining this culture, and uh, they're not in any hurry to share those those details. <laughs> Makes sense. And if anyone goes online and reads about Dunder and Muck um, or Dunder, you know, if the article is more than five years old or maybe 10 years old, it seems that there was a confusion between what is Muck and what is Dunder. Why was there this kind of mix up? Do you know? Uh, I don't know. Good question. I mean, it confused me. And then um, uh, I went to I went to uh, Jamaica in 2016 with a group of uh, people, including uh, like Camper English and Peter Holland and Mark Cade, and I vividly remember standing at the Hampton Estate Distillery um, with with Vivian Wisdom, and we finally one of us finally me but me finally got the courage to ask Vivian, but 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 where's this dunder? Like where's this where's this like, goat heads and all this crazy stuff? And he's like he's like, um, like dunder. Is just stillage. It's just what was left in the pot cells after after we used it. And go, oh, so where? You know, okay, great. So then what's all these stories about goat heads and stuff? It's like what we're talking about is what we call muck. Look down, and it was the most intensely insane, disgusting aroma uh, any of us had ever smelled. But it was sort of like it was like oh, okay. You know, and then when I got home, I immediately like, okay, this is new information, and everything I've read about this has this all screwed up. So I'm just going to set that record straight uh, as much as I can. And so that led to a couple articles, which led to more articles, and you know, basically one of my little subspecialties is documenting weird aspects of Jamaican rum. So. And I'm very privileged that I know that I know. Um, a couple of people, including like the undisputed master of, of these weird stuff, and he's happy to share certain things with me. So I'm very lucky. So. Reading your blog, it's really insightful. And like I said, I haven't been able to find the information you have almost anywhere else online, which is really something. Yeah, just, like, I don't want to write whatever what somebody else has already written. I want to, I'm going to take the time. I want to put something. <laughs> One other question about funk: Why? Isn't any other spirit able to, you know, produce the same kind of flavor profile? For example, whiskey. So, you know, it, you know, I think to a certain extent, it's, you know, this, this, do they want to? Um, and you know, to be honest, there are some. Uh, you know, Batavia Rock is you know, not exactly rum. It's sort of it's a it's a cousin of rum, if you will. But Batavia Rock certainly has notes that some would call funky. Um, it's made in Indonesia, basically using uh, red rice to sort of like create the yeast that they are then going to ferment molasses. So it's a molasses based spirit, but red rice basically creates helps create the yeast that becomes. Ah, I was confused about that. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a whole other uh, esoteric rabbit hole and going down. Um, the also. I think if you ever had, I think it's like shoshu or some some other like uh, Asian distilled spirits, which also can get this kind of like weird, kind of, weird, weird and wonderful way kind of flavors out of them. Uh, I I don't know them particularly well. I just I haven't gone down that rabbit hole just because Caribbean rum has kept me more than busy for the last several years. So makes sense to me. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I would say one thing is sort of like. Um, you know, the things we associate with funky or weird are usually tend to be uh, natural yeast, like airborne yeast or whatever. It tend to be like specialized weird organ or weird yeast varieties um, as opposed to the very tightly controlled, like if you make scotch whiskey, we use exactly this yeast. Some, you know, distiller, you know, some spirit makers, like we know our flavor profile and we're going to be very religious about what yeast we have. Whereas the sort of more... I don't say less industrialized spirits are sort of like 
hey, it started fermenting. Whatever natural yeast was in the air here is working to make something we like. So, The article you have documenting your trip through Hamden Estate is just the most eye-opening thing. It's it's really just incredible how it just looks like it's part of the earth. Yeah, go to yeah. If you haven't met the River Antoine one, go look at that one. Oh, I haven't. No, wow. Okay. Yeah, the River River. That Ham, Hampton is is a is a is a is a model of modernity compared to River Antoine. It's it's it it. I had seen a lot by the time I went to River Antoine, and I still was like, oh my god. <laughs> Wow. Okay, I'll yeah. check it out. And just as a side comment, I I tried to look this up online. I guess I just didn't use the right Google terms, but I was so confused. I was like, why the hell does Batavia Iraq use this red rice? Like, what is the purpose of that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's my understanding. I've, I've done a little, I mean, obviously a lot of the original source material is not in English. Uh, uh, there's actually a, a, um, a decent sort of peek into it. It's like highly technical, but decent peek in it um, on Boston of Help and Gary. Uh, and we talks about the Tavia Rock and like the East process and that was the red rice and East or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, search, yeah, search for Batavia Rock, red rice and East and you'll probably find it at some point. The East keyword. Okay. Um, so stepping back to rum more broadly, and I was going to ask this to you kind of as a joke, but I don't want to run the risk of someone listening to just the smallest soundbite and getting the wrong idea. So I'll kind of ask it more straightforwardly, which is if you go to the liquor or at least, you know, in Boston, Massachusetts, if you go to a liquor store, you'll see, you know, do you want silver rum, uh, dark rum um, or like overproof rum or gold rum? Could you talk about why this is like not really a helpful categorization scheme? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've written extensively about this. This is, one of my uh, biggest pet peeves and you, you don't I mean outside of a you know tequila where you say like white gold dark tequila um, you don't really see this um, basically you know basically you know there's, there's a whole article on my side where I can kind of talk about like how rum is a meta level category rather like whiskey and brandy rather than a lower level category like bourbon or scotch whiskey that's that's the <clears throat> that's sort of the overarching reason we're think we use the word rum incorrectly if we if we think of rum as like bourbon and rum as like scotch whiskey and like, no it's a meta category encompassing many subcategories of that um but but yeah i don't know if it's you know sort of intellectual laziness or what but we but you know there's such a there's such a huge diversity of rum the jamaican rum barbadian rum guadalupe rum Cuban or whatever, that consumers don't really have a have a, a readily available benchmark to sort of refer to, and like maybe we could call it a different something other than white gold dark. Um, the reality is is that, um, and I have a slide deck on this that like white rums, like white rum could be could be a lightly aged and filtered rum, could be aged five years and then aged for you know, and then filtered for color, like something like. You know, a good Bacardi or a Don Q rum. It might be, might be unaged rum. It might be rum agricole. It might be overproof Jamaican rum. But if you told your friend who didn't understand rum to go in the liquor store and like buy me a white rum, the only criteria they have to to evaluate it is like, well, well, it's not actually white. It's clear, but we can we can forgive that. We should transpo translate white clear, but still, like it's clear, it must be good. But if they bring that back to you. And suddenly, you know, you're expecting, you know, a Bacardi and then you're suddenly you're pouring rum fire into your guest drink. <laughs> not a good idea, you know, not a good thing. Um, <clears throat> same with gold. There's this gold and dark. There's this total misperception that that color equates to aging. And yes, and, and yes, if you took, you know, a sample from and put it in a barrel for three years and then measured the color and then put it in a barrel and keep put it back and each it for more years, yes, it will get dark. But Independent of that, if you just look at a bottle of rum and look at the color of it, and you try to infer its age, you're you're it's it's literally you might as well just roll the dice as to what the age is because um, many rums are, are are colored with caramel to different degrees. Um, where a rum ages it makes an enormous difference. So I have I you know I have in my one of my slide decks I have a a 14 year Jamaican rum um, that's lighter in color than a 
three year aged uh, or 40 year Jamaican rum aged in Scotland, 40 year Scotland, that is lighter in color than a three year rum aged in Puerto Rico, which is in turn lighter than a completely unaged rum made in Jamaica, but that has caramel coloring in it. So, <clears throat> and it's just, you know, the same, the same goes for dark rum. If anything dark is essentially a fairly young rum um, with a lot of caramel coloring. So colors are just are, are just horrible. They're, they don't tell you anything about flavor and they don't tell you anything about age. They're, they are, they're misused, but most consumers don't have the knowledge of vocabulary to do something better, to describe it or use better terminology for it. And it's perpetuated by liquor stores and 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 review sites, whatever, which keep using these categories. Hell, even even the rum brands who should know better. Some of them are still like, oh, here's our here's our gold rum. <laughs> so, this is this is one of the fights that I that you know in in my sort of big picture goal to help elevate rum to where it has the same level of respect and understanding the way bourbon does or Scotch whiskey does. Rum has a long way to go. The the rums are amazing, but it's the consumer understanding that has a long way to go. So categorizations are one of the biggest things that I push against and educate around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you if um, gold or aged, or sorry, I was going to ask you if gold or dark rum was your favorite, but I figured you might just hang up on me, so <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> but um, why why does rum have this categorization? Or labeling issue, whereas you know, for example, whiskey, it's very well defined at all levels. To be honest, um, you know, my sort of standard answer to that is that if you look at if you look at the spirits that are, you know, basically generally um, perceived by the curious consumer, what are the best spirits out there? What are the most high value spirits? Um, you're probably going to go, a lot of will say bourbon, some will say scotch whiskey, uh, some will say cognac. And you're like, what is, what, is, what is different about those than rum? Well, A, each of those is a single single country spirit. Bourbon can only be made in the U.S., scotch whiskey can only be in Scotland, et cetera, et cetera. <clears> They're <throat> single country spirits. Um, and B, in all three of those cases, those producers people, the producers who make those products years ago, decades ago, basically said, we're going to work together to basically elevate this category, to educate around this category and to create basically standards as to what can be called bourbon, what can be called scotch whiskey. So <clears throat> um, I forget exactly when cognac started this, but Bourbon, certain in the 1960s, and basically the federal regulation of what can be called a bourbon must be made from at least 51% uh, corn, and um, it must be aged at least, you know, if it's, if it's aged, it must be in, you know, at least as, as long and in these type of barrels, blah, blah, blah. Same with Scotch whiskey. Scotch false whiskey regulations came about in the 1960s. And so those regulations and those industry pushes around elevating those categories educating people bourbon is good and there's a wide variety of bourbons but they're all good we're basically elevating you know seeking seeking to elevate understanding of bourbon and why it's good and why it's quality something a lot of money and effort decades has been spent doing same with scotch whiskey same with cognac um and we're starting to see this in tequila as well but tequila is also you know tequila and mezcal also a single country spirit whereas rum is just a normally diverse spirit we shouldn't again we shouldn't be comparing it to bourbon or shouldn't be comparing it to scotch we should be comparing it to say whiskey it's a broader thing <clears throat> but you know it's so diverse that consumers can't typically wrap their head around it unless they really want to so they don't understand what does cuban rum mean why what makes rum cuban rum why is cuban rum separate from jamaican rum why is a Martinique rum agricole different from, you know, for example, a Demerara rum? There's this, it's such a big problem space and, and so little knowledge around it that people just go like, I don't know, it's just rum and it's gold rum and dark rum and I like this one and I don't like that one. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's just, 
it's too big of a, of a concept for a lot of people to wrap their heads around and even if they care about it. So, right. Yeah. It's, it's certainly expensive, but I would say it's rewarding. It's also like really good bottle of rum. You can get it for like $25, like $30. Mm -hmm. It's just insanely right. undervalued. No, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And I know, I know that was sort of like this vague wandering answer, but it, but it's true. I, these, these are the things I, I spend a lot of time thinking about how do how do we it's it's a it's a problem for me to solve or to try to help solve like how do we get people to understand that Jamaican rum is think of it as like the way you think of bourbon and different from Martinique rum maybe how you think about Scotch whiskey and 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 you know Demerara rum is how you might how you might think about Canadian whiskey or whatever basically get people to understand that these sort of regional styles of rum are their own distinct entities with their own regulations and their own levels of quality and we need to approach them as as distinct things rather than just hey rum's wild and crazy and has all these things in it yeah and along those lines you are labeled as um like worspa community envoy which is kind of a, a long title could you tell me what that is and what that means well yeah it's actually um i'll make it even longer so worspa is stands for the uh, the West Indies Rum and Spirits Producers Association. And um, to, 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 I could explain all sorts about it, but the, you can think of it as basically somewhat equivalent to, say, the uh, Kentucky Bourbon Association or the, the uh, Scotch Whiskey Association. Basically, trade groups, which are, their members are, producers. So the Kentucky Bourbon Association basically promotes Kentucky bourbon and educates around Kentucky bourbon and facilitates, um, say, cooperation on things like Kentucky bourbon trail tours. Single malt Scotch whiskey, or the you know, Scotch Whiskey Association, same idea of like, what are things of interest that all Scotch whiskey producers want to collaborate on? Um, education, Tra tours, trade negotiations, et cetera, et cetera. You know, clearly, clearly those groups, you know, Scotch Whiskey Association, Bourbon Association, the same with like Cognac, you know, I forget what it's called, the BNIC for Cognac. Again, trade groups are like, we are, this, these are groups fo focused on things that are beneficial to all the producers who make that spirit. And worse, but it's essentially that, but rather than being a single country, it's essentially representing um, the rum makers of the CARICOM countries. And I confess, I didn't know what exactly the definition of CARICOM was either. But it's essentially, it's a group of, it's, a, it's a, essentially, <clears throat> the very oversimplified answer is, is the set of, of Caribbean countries that were once British colonies. Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, Guyana, St. Lucia, uh, blah, 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 blah. There are some other weird exceptions to that, like Haiti's an exception, Dominican Republic exception. But essentially, it's a group of the Caribbean countries who who bound together to work on issues of of common interest for all of those things. So, if, you know, CARICOM as a whole is not specific to rum, but CARICOM as a whole is things like trade negotiations, for example, with the European Union bloc or the or the or America or or you know trade blocks in in Asia, for example, when it comes to things like import tariffs, like all these things, most people never think about. But in terms of like international trade relationships and taxation, and and codes, you know, basically like how do we classify distilled spirits for import taxation? Like all these different aspects of international trade and relations are. You know, it's better for the Caribbean countries to work together than, you know, Jamaica doing their own thing and Cuba doing their own thing and Martinique doing their own thing. Um, technically, Martinique's part of France. Um, uh, but it's essentially like we have more power together than we do individually as tiny Caribbean countries. We have more power collectively bargaining together. So WERSPA is the essentially represents the rum makers of CARICOM countries. And again, so that's going to be like all the Jamaican, Jamaican, I should be able to list them off my head. No worries, I'll post them. 
St. Lucia, um, uh, uh, Belize, uh, and I'm knowing forgetting like St. Vincent, Antigua, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's essentially all those little tiny countries. But collectively, the rum, the rum company, and they and they do a lot of interesting things behind the scenes. So you know, for example, um, uh, again, very long story short, but the Caribbean Caribbean countries got screwed during some uh, international trade negotiations that went down in 1997 and basically collectively they went to the European Union and said like you caused us economic harm um we would you know you know we'd like basically compensation and that compensation was in the form of the European Union giving money or providing funds for Caribbean rum producers to elevate basically to to um, transition from bulk rum to premium rum, to to upgrade their facilities, to you know, do better waste treatment, to you know add bottling lines, buy new caps, basically help these Caribbean producers, you know, because they cause economic harm to these Caribbean producers, basically giving them money to basically grow and expand and revamp and retool to be more efficient in the in the international market. And so, we're a spa. Worspa members helped facilitate that agreement, and then Worspa basically helped um, figure out how these funds would be spent. Like this producer gets this much for this project, this producer gets this much for this project. So it's a lot of a lot of behind the scenes things, and some other things that are more visible, like for example the authentic Caribbean rum mark. So if you look on bottles from you know, from Caricom countries, you'll often see you know the little ACR logo. Um, uh, and then, you know, there's like what was in the past some authentic Caribbean rum trainings and consumer education. Um, the group has been around, Worship has been around for 50 years. And I essentially act as sort of like the liaison intermediary between the producer groups and the producer group and and the enthusiasts because i like i can play in both camps i can i can speak i can speak rum geek to the enthusiasts and i can also speak producers so like i know you know i know all the basically all the heads of all the various worst member distilleries and i can go back and forth and you know consumers are saying this about this and there seems like an area where they're confused and maybe you want to address that or whatever so i'm sort of this intermediary um help promote worship but also promote sharing of information both ways so that's what i do i mean it's, it's actually it's a it's it's one of many different things i do i'm not i, just, I don't exclusively work for worse but i you know i do consulting for brands and producers and whatever it's just but one of many things i do but it also gives me uh great access to lots of different producers that most people don't have and so i'm very fortunate in that because that gives me more information to write and share about rum. Absolutely. Yeah. You also, I'll, I'll point, I'll put a link. Um, you have rum talks, which is where you are talking with directly with various rum producers. That's a pretty cool series. I'm not sure if you're still doing, I think you've had one as of a couple months ago, at least. Yeah, we, we would, um, it was something that started, you know, when we went into COVID lockdown and at this point, um, uh, there's still a few more we could do. It's it's a matter of like we would approach each worst by member distillery and say, hey, we'd love to do this. This is this is what, you know you can see what we've done before. Here's how it works. Very low uh, amount of work for your on your part. Um, and many of them took it up, and a few have been like, now we're not interested. That's fine. Um, and a few are just like if like a few new members have come on board uh, since we sort of pushed through that. Um, but yeah, there was it was essentially um, we may not be get to go to these distilleries anytime soon, so we're going to do as much as we can to sort of take you inside of these distilleries and take a very rum enthusiast focused look at how they make rum, you know, and not just like like what is rum? Like no, it's like we assume anybody watching these videos is a pretty hardcore rum geek, and so then knowing that we can go nerd out on. Stuff, which is which is which was a joy for me to do because I learned a lot uh, in doing that. Um, yeah, it's it's certainly one of a kind sort of interviews that you've done, which is really helpful. And I'm not sure if you were the first, you know, person. I assume you weren't the first person to know this, but you were the way that I found out about this Appleton Estate 17 year that it should be coming out sometime. That you know the community is very excited about. Um, yeah, you're kind of like I, I view you as like one of the 
like sports insiders that breaks the news on who's getting traded. Like you, you're that kind of person. That's, 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 that's what I, what I hope to, uh, you know, what I like to do. Um, in that particular case, it was sort of, it was a, a US TTV label approval. So, you know, it's all, it's public information. It's out there. It's just the U S government sometimes doesn't make things easy, but you know, it's, if I, if I can reverse engineer windows, I can make, make <laughs> the TTV website. So, yeah. That's great. Um, a few more questions with Rum, if that, if that's, I mean, there is a almost, there's like a semi-infinite number of questions I could ask you, but I'll, you know, try and keep it to the reasonable ones. Um, so, well, I guess sugarcane spirits more broadly, there's rum, but there's also rum agricole and there's cachaca. Could you just mention briefly what these are? So, um, at the end, at the end of the day, they're all sugarcane spirits, and generally speaking, the the names we choose to apply to them are based more on social traditions than on necessarily technical differentiations. So, you know, sort of like, you know, there's there's debate like is is cachaça a spirit of its own or is it rum made in Brazil? Um, and, you know, and, you know, there's people on both sides of what it should be called, but, you know, we, we are respecting the Brazilian tradition of calling cachaça. Um, but, you know, if, if a, if a, if you took somebody who had no knowledge of rum or an alien from space <clears throat> and put them down and, and looked at cachaça production, looked at a, say Martinique rum agricole production, they would they would find small. There'd be very small differences, but they basically say, oh, they're doing the same thing. So they're all. I prefer to, you know, I said I when I'm talking about the broader set of things, not just Jimmy can rum or whatever. I tend to use the, the name sugarcane spirits because it lumps it properly encompasses what they are. Um, but to those particular two examples, for example, rum agricole is is essentially um, cane, rum made from sugarcane juice rather than molasses or, or cane syrup. That's basically rum made from sugarcane juice, um, primarily associated with um, the French uh, the French territories, um, uh, French um, French rum making regions, Martinique, Guadeloupe. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. However, there's the EU definition of what can be called rum agricole, um, which I think also includes uh, Madeira. So you get, you know, what, what, you know, again, a name actually depends on who's using that name and where they're using that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, TLDR, rum agricole is essentially rum made from sugarcane juice, um, depending, again, depending on what, whose definition of it you mean. Uh, cachaca, is, is basically sugarcane juice rum or sugarcane juice spirit made in Brazil. Uh, cachaça has distinct regulations around what can be called cachaça versus something else. There's an article on my site that goes through Brazil's regulations of cachaça. Um, uh, likewise, there are regulations around what can be called Martinique rum agricole, uh, Guadeloupe rum agricole, all sorts of regulations. People say rum has no rules. There's plenty of rules. Um, but essentially, you know, if you go, go a step higher here, you'd say like the Chasa and Rum Agricole are probably the two best known examples of rum made from sugarcane juice rather than molasses. Most, most like Americans and Europeans, with the exception of people from France or Brazilians, most of your, you know, our sort of center for you and me, our center of mass is molasses based rums and sugarcane juice rums are sort of like the exception. But if you go to Brazil, no, sugarcane juice rums are the norm. Uh, same in France. They, they, you know, cane juice, sugarcane juice rums are sort of their frame of reference. So that's, that's the, the oh, probably overly long answer there. No, it's, it's wonderful. And I understand that in Brazil, there's kind of unique woods that they can use to age the cachaça. Right. But if you take an unaged rum agricole and an unaged cachaça, in principle, are they the same thing? They're, they are, so there are, there are typically small production differences. Um, 
the the rum agricoles in Martinique have to be distilled in a column still, and they have and there's a limit range on on the ABV is of them. Uh, the cachaças, at least the artisanal cachaças, uh, big brands like uh, Apua or Novo Fogo here in America. <clears throat> um, those artisanal cachaças are usually pot distilled and usually just pot distilled to a slightly lower strength. Um, I think Martinique as well favors particular yeast strains. I don't know if they're, I don't actually know if Brazilians are to use a different strain. So they're like, if you put them side by side, there are taste differences. Like if, if you're an ex experienced spirit taster, you will pick up taste differences. Um, you know, but they're on, the, I would say, on the smaller end of the scale. If, if you took a neophyte and gave them rum agricole and gave them cachaça, an aged version of each, you would, they'd go like, they're essentially the same thing. They both have that sort of very raw, grassy, sugar cane juice, rum taste to them. Um, but, you know, as you noted, um, the uh, Brazilians, they have lots of, lots of hardwood forests and they use other, other types of wood like uh, alburana, um, which has a crazy sort of like cinnamony note, uh, they will they will age in woods that are traditionally not used um, elsewhere. It's basically, non-standard European oak or American white oak type of thing. So Brazilian, you know, they said the aged cachaças uh, or unaged cachaças could be you know an unaged from agricole, fairly similar, but once you age them, sort of like Rum agricoles go in one direction, and uh, ambiorana cachaças or the hardwood, neat hardwood cachaças go in a very different direction. Okay, great. Yeah, I was I couldn't find an exact answer in the unaged case comparing these two spirits, so I went out and bought um, an avoa unaged, and I forget which rum agricole. Um, they were very similar, but uh, it's definitely different, and particularly the you know the smell of the. Um, Avo was a lot stronger, and I I chalked that up to I believe the Avo is pot distilled. And it is pot, yeah, pot distilled. And I'm understanding that it's a. I want to double check this, but my understanding, for example, is that it's um, single distilled and pot still. So like to a relatively low strength. So I, I could be wrong, but I think it's basically if you go like most pot, you know, traditional pot still distillations require two passes. You know, your, for your stripping run and then your second distillation. But I think, again, don't quote me on this, but I think if you go really slow and do your cuts right, you can just do one pass to a relatively low, to a relatively low strength. And I think that's uh, how that's what's being made. And I know the Avant guys well, so I should know this, but I, I'm hedging. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, I hadn't considered the, the differences in the yeast, so that probably also, you know, accounts for some of it. That's useful. Yeah, I couldn't find a good answer online, so... Um, I'm happy that I asked you about that. Um, so stepping back again to just kind of rum, I, or I guess I would say, I tend to think of myself as a scientist and I basically learn something, throw away the history and just take the physics part of it, you know, that I can see right in front of me. You, I've seen you described, you know, in many ways as a historian. Could you talk about the value in understanding the history of rum or the history of tiki? Great question. I, lo I love this question. Um, you know, as you noted, as a scientist, if, you're, if your only task is to take something and do something with it, like here's my starting input and I need to transform it into something else or do something with it, then yes, the history doesn't really matter. But I think that... Um, if you want to go a little bit deeper, if, if you're sort of like, if you care about something, you might want to know, how does this come about? Like, how did this, how does this come to be? So, um, in terms of rum, in terms of history, um, you know, and there's all sorts of different branches of rum history, <clears throat> but the one, the one that, where I seem to have found myself gravitating is what I would call like the evolution of rum styles. Like, if you go back to the, 1600s, you know, when Caribbean rum started, uh, it was really crude stuff. Um, and it was kind of, from everything we can say, see, is it was so crude that it was kind of the same everywhere. That if you think about a 1640, say, pick a day, um, the stills were all going to be of a fairly simple pot still variety. 
Um, there was no knowledge of of um, yeast in any sort of like realistic way, the way Pasteur learned about yeast and the, the correlation between yeast and converting sugars and alcohol. So yeast was like, I don't know, it just left it to sit here and starts fermenting. Um, there was really no, there was really no um, barrel aging as a as a way of refining rum. They were like making the rum and drinking it, and so it was basically a very crude agricultural stuff. Like, hey, this stuff left over from the from the sugar mill house, um, throw it in some vats, let it ferment, distill it as best we can, and give it to the enslaved people or the indentured servants to drink as to you know drink because it keeps them you know happy you know not happy but you know what i mean <clears throat> it was essentially um but if you were to look at what was going on in jamaica or cuba or you know, saint lucia it was not radically different um so it was literally you were going to get a really rough raw rum and they might have tasted differently based upon say whatever local native ambient yeast they had but there was no um, consistent style. It wasn't. You, there's no evidence that like St. Lucia rums tasted like this, and always tasted like this. And Demerara rums tasted always like this. It was literally whatever we can have on hand to turn into rum, and it would change over the course of the season. That you know, like sugarcane levels or the amount of sugar would drop. The yeast might change when it got colder, or whatever. It was like wildly consistent. <clears throat> and not in any way sort of organized and like we are going to make the finest quality rum year after year. And so from that sort of like sort of like rough and wild um, starting point, we start at some point we see, oh, the Jamaicans start making rums we would call funky that became their specialty. At some point we see, hey, the French folks are making a tea juice rum. Um, we see, oh, um, the Germans are asking the Jamaicans for a super funky rum. Hey, these these folks in Cuba now are making a rum that's uh, not fermentation forward, but is excellently aged the way uh, the way a brandy, fine brandy, would be aged. And so, if you look at the rum world now, you look at all these different styles. You have these like heavy, smoky Demerara rums. You have the funky Jamaican rum. You have these sort of like perfectly blended St. Lucia rums. You have rum agricole. <clears throat> you have Grande Rome, all these different styles. It's like those didn't exist in 1640. I like these as well-defined, consistent style. So my that branch of history is like, where did these actually come about? Like, like what factors played uh, a part of that? And it turns out they were like um, uh, certainly you know scientific ad advancement of scientific understanding, the Industrial Revolution, changes in sugar processing, changes in, in uh, distillation uh, technologies, um, political, um, like political rival, or basically like international rival rivalries sort of led to the rum agricole as we know it today. Um, Geo, 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 geological happenings, you know, volcanoes erupting. It's just sort of fascinating to sort of like, how did we get here? And so, and so yes, at the, at the, at the end of the day, if your, if your job is simply to, if you just want to enjoy rum, you don't need that history. If you want to, if you need to do something about rum, um, you don't need a history. But if you, if you care about it the way we care about all sorts of other things, you just, it's interesting to know that history and know how does it get to this point or, or be able to say like this rum from this country, but is very different from the traditional type of rum in that country. And it's that historical understanding that, <clears throat> that, you know, helps us there. And it's also, you know, the other aspect of history I love to do is uh, debunking myths that there's sort of like, you know, brands will tell you that, you know, this and this and uh, Navy strength rum or, or, you know, whatever an arguments were made around whether this was a traditional practice or not. And it's like, yeah, no, they, if you, if you just go back in the history books you, and know where you're looking and dig enough and connect the dots. So oftentimes what we accept as, as common wisdom is, is in fact incorrect that, you know, maybe strength is not 
57% ABV. It's, it, Navy issued a 54.5% ABV. And Jamaican rum was not traditionally a main component of, of Navy rum. But, you know, I, I, love, I love debunking this. So, so the history, history helps quite a bit now. Yeah, the idea of the Navy strength mishap is, I mean, I certainly see on bottles all the time that it's, you know, yeah. bottled at 114.5 yeah. proof yeah. and is labeled as Navy strength. Um, yeah. Out of curiosity, you'd mentioned, you know, roughly 1640 or so, all rums were, you know, more or less the same. What, uh, how long did it take to get to this branching point where, you know, there's a ton of different styles? Would you say like 1900? I would say, I mean, big, the, 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 the most seminal transition in rum came about with the industrial revolution. Uh, and two, two key things. Uh, one is that sugar processing became radically different, um, uh, much bigger in scale, um, and, you know, it seems like, you know, from, you know, from, from an outsider perspective, you're Michael White over there. Why so why does that matter? But it actually um, helped, it sort of broke apart that original plantation model of, of, of like small estates doing everything, making, from planting the sugar cane to creating the rum, it used to be done all in these small estates, all, you know, and so all aspects of it were done right there. And um, the centralized sugar factories, you know, big industrial sugar factories, let A, more molasses could be produced on a large scale and basically enabled much more sugar to be processed. Uh, and B, if their output was large quantities of molasses, you then didn't need to have your distillery in the middle of a sugar cane field. Like it doesn't need to be right next to the sugar cane mill. Like you could make molasses from, for example, Martinique ship it to the United States where the New England rum was being made. Because if you think about New England rum, where were they getting their molasses from in, you know, in the 1750s? It certainly wasn't locally grown sugar cane. So, <clears throat> so yeah, you, could, you could say in that regard, um, thing, you know, the Industrial Revolution changed sugar as a whole. And rum was, in that era, basically rum was always considered just like one aspect of the sugar industry it was not its own thing. So it's like one part of sugar along with other other things. So the other things, so industrial revolution, A, changes sugar processing capacity techniques, and B, new distillation techniques. So you see um, in the introduction of column still, um, you know, the what column still was basically invented in Europe and different people were invent or basically evolving at different times. But by the time, you know, we get to Aeneas Coffee in 1830, it was pretty, pretty well established there. And it popped over to the Caribbean and also to um, basically India and Southeast Asia very quickly, faster than I would have expected. So column distillation changed the, the flavor profile of rum and also, um, Double retort pot stills, the ability to distill in one pass rather than two. Um, those two things are sort of like seminal moments where you start seeing some some regions adopting column stills quickly, other ones you know clinging to their pot stills through the 1960s, Jamaica. Um, but yeah, you know, and even as well as in there, like somewhere in there, like Pasteur, and you and understanding uh, yeast better. You know, sort of like it was that age of science and, and industry that sort of like let everybody sort of like spurred everybody to go off in different directions. Uh, you had mentioned that at some point the Germans started asking the Jamaicans for really, really high funk rums. Why was that? Uh, to save money. Um, essentially, um, high import taxes, basically. Um, Germany loved Jamaican rum, 17, or I'm sorry, 1860s, 1870s. German loves Jamaican rum. Germany loves Jamaican rum. Lots of it's being imported. Jamaicans are happy to sell it to them. And at some point, German just decides like, hey, we make stuff here. We have beet spirits. Like, why are, like, you know, a whole long story involving sugar, the sugar wars and all that kind of stuff. Long story short, Germany imposes a very high tax on imported spirit, impartial partially to favor their local lemon spirit. And so some enterprising blunders or blunders is like, well, 
we get a funky enough Jamaican rum, take the funkiest thing we have out there, we can basically cut it with our local neutral spirit, a beet spirit probably, basically cut it and sell that as Jamaican rum. Basically, like I said, it's like literally cutting it, like blending it with something. <laughs> and then, you know, that worked. Um, it was called Rumberschnitt. And, you know, naturally it would be like, hey, you know, like the funk, you know, you know, but that, and so by cutting it, they can import less rum. Like, okay, instead of importing, you know, you know, a, you know, a thousand gallons, typical Jamaican rum, we can import like five gallons of the funkiest Jamaican rum we have available and cut it. And so, but that five gallons of funky Jamaican rum is going to be higher priced. And so it would be natural that, you know, you know, these, these, the funkier, more flavorful rums would, would command a higher price. And so, you know, presumably, and this is where it's a little fuzzy, presumably the Jamaican's like, oh, you like that? We can, you know, we can certainly give you something funkier. We can, we can, you know, crank that up and give you an even higher um, uh, congener laden rum uh, to work with here. And um, we see, we certainly see that um, the scientific, there, you know, there are papers that describe the work of people like Cousins and Ashby to sort of like crank up those ester levels and, and create more flavorful rum. So, there's still a few dots I would like to connect there, but yeah, essentially, like Germany's like, we we want to import as little rum as possible. We want it to be as, as flavorful and funky as possible. So basically, it was, it was financial incentive to the Jamaicans to make a more funky rum, um, and you know, and then that leads to a whole other interesting story. You know, I might write about at some point. I might write a short book about it, something about basically like. What the hell happened in the 1900s with the rum spirit pool and the limit on esters and and it's, it's a whole great little story that that's a uh, uh, you know political intrigue that's just never really been told uh, in the modern era. So someday I might write a book on that. I'd love to read about it. Uh, but to ask kind of a stupid, probably stupid follow up question. Um, okay, so Germany tariffs or taxes are raised such that you know you have. You want to import, import basically the funkiest, or the spirit with the highest funk density. Um, why, why didn't the Germans just, you know, make a funky spirit at home instead of having to import it all the way from halfway around the world? Uh, they tried. They tried. Oh, exactly. really? They tried. Um, apparently, you know, and this this is sort of the outer limits of what I've researched, but um, you know. They don't. They don't have. They didn't have a whole lot of sugar cane to, to to work with there. You know, could, they could have played with molasses, but you know, they had all. They had all sorts of sugar beet um, molasses there. And um, what, from what I've read, and again, this is where I'm fuzzy. From what I've read, like the, the a spirit made from beet sugar molasses is not as good. There's something. There's something off about it. Like it doesn't have that same flavor. Um, doesn't mean some of it was sold, um, but uh, I think it was just one of those. This is a great idea, but it didn't pan out in reality. So, yeah, again, it's, it's one of those areas that that I would um, someday will go down that rabbit hole deeper than I have already. Got it. Okay, and kind of relatedly, um, I, you know, I'm from the Boston area, and there was at least you know in. 19 or early early 1900s i think there was you know the great molasses flood in boston where a molasses tank you know blew open but there's this style of rum called medford rum right. i've only and i've only had a few different bottles but they're all kind of like very boring and kind of depressing and like it, it, i live right next to medford the town medford and i would love for it to be just this amazing spirit that like i can proudly you know this is medford rum and it's great but it's just not and are, are there any like kind of reasons why that might be? Yeah, it's a it's a, it's an interesting. Um, what do I, do you know when they when they were distilled? Yeah, it's well, I mean, yeah, it was distilled within the past like couple of years. I don't know. Okay, yeah, yeah. Med Medfirm rum was known and recognized as a as a name, and it was known known for being particularly you know flavorful and what have you. Um, there's a great paper I can send you uh, written by uh, Peter Baylor in 1937. He worked for the U.S. government. Um, describes it as very flavorful, and basically, um, 
you know, New England rum was already starting to fade away um, when Prohibition approached, and Prohibition basically like cut off all the air. So um, it sort of limped along. Basically, by the think by the 1960s, it was basically it was just not nobody was making rum. But at some point, you know, <coughs> you know, the American craft distilling comes along like let's make spirits everywhere in small distilleries you're like hey you know medford rum we're in medford or close to medford let's let's name it medford rum you know i'm not i like i said i'm not calling out any particular distillery but it's very easy for for a distillery to slap a name on something and call it this style and have it not actually be indicative of what it was in its heyday, so I wouldn't judge on that. There actually was a, um, I think actually the the guy who owns Privateer, uh, Andrew Cabot, um, he actually has some old Bedford rum. He actually old small rums, and and there was a bottle that uh, years ago, um, a couple of years ago, like it was a Medford style rum uh, that was opened at Rumbo Seattle, and I sadly was was gonna get to be there and miss it and did get to go. <clears throat> so I yeah I've never I've never had Medford style rum myself, but I said from the description I read in this Baylor report, which is a great document, it's got all sorts of science in it, uh, it was known it was supposedly very flavorful. So wow, okay, interesting. I think it would be useful if you could you know switch over from talking about rum broadly to talking about its kind of close companion, which is tiki. To start off, could you just explain what is tiki? I get asked that a lot. Um, and it's become sort of politically, you know, charged in, in recent years. But um, the the people who have been doing tiki for a while, or what we call tiki, uh, it's essentially, um, it's escapism. It's, it's, it's essentially, you know, if you think of, you know, you know, why people go to Disneyland, for example, it's like you're transported into a different world for a short period of time. <clears throat> you get to live in a idealized, different environment. And so, um, tiki tiki bars, as we know them today, sort of originated at the right after Prohibition ended. We were still in the in the um, skin middle of the Depression, and they were essentially a way for people to escape sort of like their everyday life. You can go into this sort of like idealized version of Polynesia. And you can enjoy drinks that certainly seem like they could have come from there, you know, fruits and spices and rums. And there's no outside world, you know, there's no windows, whatever. It's literally create a little like immersive experience where, you know, for a few hours and a few cocktails, you get to imagine you're in the South Pacific or something like that. And that's what, that's what. You know, I would think most people would say is the essence of it. It's not cocktails per se. It's escapism, and and certainly cocktails can play an important part of that. You know, the you know a, a good mai tai while you're while you're listening to you know exotica music and you know with <clears throat> you know beautiful ferns and and you know nautical stuff. It's 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 escapism. It's it's really no different than the, you know people go to Disneyland and immerse themselves into you know Star Wars stuff, for example. It's just it's what uh, what came about in the 1930s and and grew into a cultural phenomena uh, by the 1950s. So okay, and then talking about the you know drinks that you make specifically, um, if it's okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll steal from your book. If you don't want me to, just let me know. But um, in, in your book, you kind of, it's like a little bit difficult to classify. Like if someone asks you like, oh, you know, what is a Negroni? There's a very clear description there. But if you ask, you know, what is a tiki cocktail? What makes something a tiki cocktail versus not? Um, you list a few criteria. So you talk about having a, a, a special pattern, which is, you know, what you call a sour pattern which has a spirit, citrus, and a sweet component. Um, some use of an exotic flavor, um, like allspice or passion fruit, for example. And then well-balanced, um, usually served with crushed ice, and then kind of looks appropriate. So you typically have you know, right glassware and garnishes. Um, and you also note that it has to, you know, technically should be 
any recipe after 1934. And what's special about that date? So, you know, that, you know, you, it's somewhat arbitrary, but if you think about, if we think, if we go, okay, what was the first bar that we would today say, like, this was the you know, you know, first example of a bar that sort of, that we'd recognize today as, as a tiki bar, as we think of them. Uh, it would have been uh, the, uh, I forget the very initial name, but essentially what became um, like Don's Beachcomber, I think it was called. I should remember this. But essentially, it was in um, uh, in L.A., the L.A. area, and um, you know Don Beach, and, um, and he, you know, and it was his work, Don Beach's work, and then later, you know. Lots of people tried to imitate and copy him, uh, none, none so effectively as, as Victor Bergeron, Trader Vic. Uh, <clears throat> it was those, it was Don and then Vic who sort of spawned this becoming a cultural phenomenon, like opening more bars in different cities and ever more elaborate presentations of, of Exotica. Um, so, um, no, I forget the question. <laughs> so look at the cocktails. Uh, yeah. So why 1934? Yeah. So that was it. Because basically, before then, there were drinks that we would, you know, that maybe, maybe some cheeky bars serve today, like a Queen's Park Swizzle, for example. There, are, you know, there's what we call proto tiki, like like things that are maybe sours but aren't exactly that don't fit sort of within the center of mass of the tiki pattern but we can recognize as influences of them um i mean at the end of the day it's it's like you know different hit you know you could take 10 historians and give put them in the same context and they might come up with 10 different interpretations and and terminology and seminal dates and what have you but um within the tiki community 1934 is sort of like you know the the you know the the origin story sort of starts in 1934 with with Don Don the Beach Gunner. Right. Okay. Yeah. I uh, a while ago I asked my brother-in-law, who's you know fairly decent cocktail maker himself, what you know how do you, what's how do you know if a drink is a tiki cocktail compared to you know a normal a normal drink? And he said attitude, and that kind of made sense to me. <laughs> I mean, there is an element of that, and I would say you know that's sort of like. The glassware and the you know, glassware and the garnishes it's sort of though those things are are part of that escapism it's part of they sort of contribute to that experience like you can make a wonderful mai tai but if you served it in a nick and nora glass without ice it's like, it was like it tastes the same sure close enough but it's also not particularly escapist uh, if you will um Along those lines, there's a particular, you know, kind of decor associated with, you know, tiki. Not, I'm not talking about the cocktails, but I'm talking about the way that the bar is designed and, you know, even, you know, the shirts that people wear, dress wear. How important to that is that to kind of the whole ambiance? I mean, you know, I, I think it's going to depend from person to person, you know, like, you know, some some days I will, you know, just wander out, you know, dress like this, wander out and make myself a Mai Tai and not put a garnish on it because it's, it's I'm just tired and I want to drink. Um, and it's still tiki. But, you know, I think that um, if you're going to a bar, you know, when, yeah, you know, going going to a tiki bar, going to a Smuggler's Cove or the Mai Tai or Latitude 29 is... is most people want that a very sort of immersive experience. It's different than just going to your local, your you know, your local Chili's or something. <laughs> it's just, it's those touches that that you know make it you know, make it unique, make it special. And, and you know, there's a, there's a you know, it's sort of like you know, you mentioned earlier, form versus function. You know, it's just like, is it is is this, you know. Does it, is it necessary for function? No, you don't need the paper umbrella. You don't need the necessarily need the pineapple fronds and and the, and the, all the crazy stuff. But the form, or but the, the form of it actually enhances our experience, or can enhance our experience. So, yeah, interesting. I, so, I come at it from a perspective of so a, a, a similar sort of idea, but obviously different direction. Are like speakeasy bars. Um, which I, you know, personally, I absolutely hate 
I think it's kind of, you know, I think it's lame and the drinks are usually horrible. It's usually like a $5 Negroni, which is, you know, you get what you pay for. Um, the Tiki thing is certainly a step in the right direction, but what I really value is just, they're just the most interesting, at least from what I found, they're the most interesting recipes. They're extremely well thought out. They're extremely balanced. They're unique. Like I'm only 27 years old and I'm already so tired of going to a restaurant and like, oh, what do you know? It's like a small variation to an old fashioned, a small variation to a margarita and like a small variation to a Negroni. It's just like, I'm not paying $20 for this. Are you kidding me? Um, the tiki cocktails are the most interesting beverage class that I've encountered. Um, I do wonder if it's possible to take those interesting, you know, drink elements. And uh, your book talks about the importance of garnishes in some way, not just from an aesthetics point of view, but also kind of vegetal notes from like a banana leaf, for example. And I think that that's important, but I do wonder if it's possible to kind of port the, you know, extravagant and wonderful cocktails you get from the land of Tiki into some other kind of environment that isn't escapism per se, but is, you know, some other sort of locale. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good, it's a good, it's an open question. I, <clears throat> I, I think that um, certainly Tiki, you know, uh, while you're top thinking or while you're speaking, I thought of an analogy, um, sort of like, you know, I'm I'm at that age where like I grew up in the in the early '80s, and so yes, I loved heavy metal. I love Guns and Roses, all the kind of stuff. <clears throat> you know, and there were people who will look down on that genre, which is fine. But if you actually look at some of the musicianship, the skill that goes into that is like some of the best musicians out there work in that space. And I think that's some, somewhat like Tiki. And that, you know, there's people who just think like it's all overly sweet drinks and you just pour a bunch of juices and some rum in. Like, no, like the people, the good people, like the ones we are in our book, you know, the Doc Parks and the Jason Alexanders, you know, and the Daniel and the Paulas and all those people, they're like, these are really great bartenders who could, who would excel in any bar doing interesting drinks. Um, in terms of, of sort of like transporting it, it's like a different, what to, what to call it, not lifestyle, <clears throat> but um, sort of like a different overarching theme, you know, maybe rockabilly or, or some other thing. Um, and so it's certainly, you know, certainly possible. I don't, you know, in, in the book, I, I think in the book I, I mentioned, like there's really no other, in, in the context of rum, so there's no other spirit that has its own sort of like auxiliary parallel sort of lifestyle movement around it that we have conventions you know you know you know there are the tiki conventions and I'm like do we have this for bourbon i mean you know like other other than a bunch of bourbon together is drink you know getting together to you know drink tasting notes together do they have you know like bourbon conventions where they're all doing you know like you know historic recreations or whatever like no there's just no real there's really no other spirit that has that sort of like whole other lifestyle thing around it uh as Tiki and rum um, so yeah i don't you know i don't know what that beat would be um <clears throat> i do think of tiki as a sort of cultural snowball i've used that terminology where it's sort of like as it rolled through history it picks up other sort of like incorporated other elements of the popular culture at the time. So if you think about it, <clears throat> you know, you know, 1934, Don Beach, Polynesia, escapism, how the hell did we end up with the jet pilot right. or <laughs> Saturn as Tiki Dream? Like, what was that? What was that? You know, that leap is like, what was that leap? And you're like, well, by the time, you know, 50s came around, we were in that, like, the jet age and, and and space exploration, they were like, those are in public consciousness. And so they kind of rolled into it. Sort of like, we incorporate that in. And even like, even today, we are seeing, you know, people like Jason Alexander are now incorporating, you know, we see Star Wars tiki stuff. This is a natural, I mean, some people hate it, but so is that. Sort of Star Wars is also escapism. Um, 
and even sort of like um, uh, goth or dark thing like the war and sort of like other sort of like horror horror and play we sort of again these are things that like are in, are in a popular culture or at least the people who are making geeky drinks are fans of these things and so they roll these things into it so you sort of like grown from the simple like you know escape of Polynesia to like, this whole much bigger thing you know and it's, and it's funny like if we go to we went to Tiki Con in Arizona together uh, a couple months ago and there's a whole class of people totally into Tiki and they like the drinks but they're not the center of it for them but they have these like houses which are like like museums of like mid-century modern stuff and like artwork and exotica it's sort of like like i think of tiki as sort of like tiki is a sort of like nebulous thing where you're like pick any three from these columns and like that's your tiki experience like some people are probably like rockabilly and tiki <clears throat> so everybody has their you know everybody's a tiki person has their own sort of like set of things that they embrace fully as part of it and i think maybe they don't care as much about it you know like their you know lifestyle tiki i i, I dig mid-century modern but i'm not gonna go make that of my life um, for me it's more cocktails uh and stuff but other people was like cocktails are a lesser part compared to rockabilly and mid-century modern whatever those choices they make so for like choose your own adventure yeah it's interesting that you mentioned that about the star wars and tiki thing um i forget if i mentioned this to you but a few years ago i made um, you know, like these ice presses that, you know, are a few hundred dollars and they're blocks of aluminum that kind of come together. Yeah. Make a sphere or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I made that, but I machined it so it will press out a little version of the Death Star. <laughs> yeah. There are, actually, there, are, there are like Death Star silicon molds as well. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, the reason that I thought this was interesting is because um, with the silicone molds, you can't get like clear ice really right, out of exactly. it. So you end up with like a cloudy, like not exactly. great looking exactly. um anyways yeah I, i've always wondered if there would be kind of a world where people would be interested in like a star wars uh like escapism sort of sort of thing yeah i mean it's there you know there a lot, a lot of my friends are into star wars tiki and i'm like you know and there are some people who are like star wars is not tiki you know there's you know as as with any sociological group or you know, there's factions and there's opinions and there's like this is part of it this is part of it and like you know and you know, they got an argument. I mean, we're we're fine now. I sort of like online argument with Ben for Kirsten, sort of like one of the seminal people, sort of reviving it basically about whether if there were a forum was called Tiki History, should I have posted something about Martin Kate? And I'm like, well, of course he's Tiki. And I was like, well, no, but this is a Tiki revival of history, not Tiki. <laughs> oh wow, okay. <laughs> you know, you know, like I said, there's. There, you know, there's it's a big family, and not everybody in the family agrees on all things. Yeah, yeah. And then one more question, and we kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you talk a little bit about this strange? So there's a very, very strong correlation between the spirit of rum and the world of tiki. And as you mentioned, it's not like there's a particular set of cocktails that goes along with bourbon in like you know some way that people really follow along in, in droves what what's what's going on here why is there this correlation yeah i mean it's an interesting question how did rum how did rum become the focus of it um i think there's a number of different reasons i don't think there's one sole reason um amongst them like one 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 thing that could be true is that when um don started in 34 uh just coming out of prohibition uh, American whiskey was basically was not being produced other than for medicinal whiskey purposes. <clears throat> so there was not um, there was not lots of cheap American three year five year aged whiskey uh, at that point in time. However, um, Caribbean was not part of was not part of not part of you know U.S. prohibition. Other than Puerto Rico, um, so in Virgin Islands, uh, but. Um, Essentially, like, there was plenty of Caribbean rum, you know, that was now available to come in, and certainly cheaper, um, that would have been cheaper, you know, and there are stories about basically, um, you know, 
retail or you know, wholesalers and distributors going like, if you want a case of our whiskey, you need to buy four cases of our rum that we're also selling. So, um, you know, that that story is said in conjunction with like the hurricane in New Orleans. Um, so, um, you know, there's one it's sort of an economic economic costs and availability may have been one aspect. Um, also, um, just some of the proto tiki drinks that we have out there that were may have been based on like the Queen's Bart Swizzle and the, and the things that uh, and the daiquiri and things like that were naturally rum based. Uh, another one was that um, the diversity of flavors in rum <clears throat> much greater. So we see in those Don recipes, you know, he's not calling for rum. He's calling for like, you know, a Cuban rum or a, 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 you know, a Jamaican rum or a Demerara rum. He was aware of these different flavor profiles and used them to craft different different flavors. Um, something is going to be a lot harder, like the available American bourbons when you don't have, are going to be very small flavor profile wise compared to Demerara rum versus Jamaican rum versus Cuban rum. So I think it's just a broader palette to work from. Um, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. It's been debated and researched in the Tiki community. Okay. So I wanted to ask you a couple kind of present and future looking questions. Um, so the first one is uh, Dave Arnold has a popular book called Liquid Intelligence that isn't really molecular gastronomy, but it's a very like chemist look at making cocktails. And I wondered what your thoughts were on going forward, the involvement of molecular gastronomy techniques. So basically like, you know, fancy science stuff uh, brought to the world of Tiki. Um, it's, a, you know, I think my, my response surprises me because like, from one perspective, you know, somebody with a strong science background and wanting to understand and everything, I should have been all over that. Um, and I have the book, but I confess I've not actually read it other than poking through it. Um, there's, you know, and I, and I love going to bars where they're doing that. Like if they're doing something interesting and they're making, you know, acid adjusting a, a juice or making your own interesting ingredients. I'm all over that. Like I want to to experience that. I will seek that out <clears throat> to see to see what's possible. But for whatever reason, I don't I, I just don't find myself wanting to do all the crazy stuff at home. Like and I think maybe it's a little bit of, of like um, if it was like, it was like, oh, I can do this in five minutes and I'll have enough to, to, uh, to make, you know, one drink. And if I like it, great. If I don't, that's fine too. I might do more of it, but it's, it's usually like, oh, you know, two hours and get buy this, buy this, have this equipment. Blah, blah, blah. And then at the end of it, you have a quarter of this stuff. And now you're like, okay, so I made a drink and maybe I tried it with something else, but now I still have almost a quarter of this left. And at some point, like I have a refrigerator full of interesting experiments, and then they start going bad or whatever. It's sort of, it's sort of like it's a. If I, if I think if I worked at a bar, if like I was doing this, I can make these experiments, and I can you know bury <laughs> bury it if it's not good, or get get through it in two or three days if it's if it is good or whatever. It's just it's it's sort of I think it comes down to that the distinction between like what you know what home bartenders can real take on versus what a commercial bartender who operates at a different scale can take on. I'm not saying you can't do molecular astronomy at home. I'm just saying like it's a big it's a big commitment for something when you're like you're probably making drinks for you and your wife or you and some friends and you have all this other stuff that sort of like lingers on afterwards. So I think that's sort of it's you know practicality or or whatever you want to call it. You know, it's not like I've never done that stuff. Like I've made the, the um, you know, the various the syrups. I'm forgetting the name of it, like the thickening agent. <clears throat> you know, you know, and I've played around with stuff like making shrubs and that kind of stuff. But I'm not, not going to crazy. Like, like do I want to spend eight hundred dollars for a centrifuge? You know, right. <laughs> but, yes, I absolutely would. I would absolutely love the centrifuge for my pineapple juice. But eight hundred dollars want that. And then like, oh, and I also don't have a laboratory with infinite space to store all this stuff. So it's, it's more of a practical thing. 
Fair enough. And I've seen you say before, uh, this, this is just out of curiosity. I've seen you say before that, you know, you have a lot of respect for people that, you know, run bars, but that you wouldn't ever do it yourself personally. Is that because of the time commitment involved? Not, uh, well, partially time commitment is more like so much is out of your control. And so, and like I have lots of friends who run bars and I will go spend my money with them and enjoy them and support them. But, you know, just all the stories, you know, you're like, okay, yep, you own the bar. Guess what? You're also cleaning the bathroom at 3 a.m. You're, you know, you're using your Saturday to go wait for the plumber to arrive. It's like all, all the, you know, for, for somebody who you know, built, basically built their career around building very precise models of how things work and making them execute flawlessly, i.e. writing code, running a bar is like the exact opposite of that. Everything's random and chaotic and, you know, your best laid plans don't matter. Um, so, you know, like I said, I would, I would rather, you know, make drinks for my friends at home, have people over, make a round of drinks, play bartender there. I just don't have no desire to deal with liquor control boards and plumbers and all that stuff. And like I said, I, I do everything I can to support my bar owner friends. And I get Godspeed. Thank you for doing this. <laughs> so. so another question you wrote, you know, a really great book, which you've talked about, which is minimalist Tiki. And certainly in the, first part of the book you talk about you know notably kind of like 30 of the most you know the the 30 cocktails that really represent tiki which is hard to do because there's hundreds if not thousands and you talk about what's the minimal amount of equipment and involvement you need to sort of do this reasonably on the other end of the spectrum you could kind of call it maximalist tiki and i wonder if you have any ideas on kind of no holds barred what would be, you know, I give you anything you want. What would I kind of be looking at for the, you know, biggest and best Tiki experience? It's an interesting question. Um, people, you know, I, I hear Maximus Tiki said all, all the time. And it's also, and it's often um, phrases, you know, like, oh, you know, six different rums and 14 ingredient cocktails and, I think there's one in recipe in our book that has either 14 or 17 ingredients. But um, the thing is, is that at some point, you know, when you start going to the, if you're talking about something like Maximus Tiki, meaning um, the most crazy and exotic ingredients, at some point, um, if it's just like sheer number of things, then, then at some point, it's sort of like, they it's some they all sort of morph into something vaguely tiki like, but you know the, the value of a quarter of an ounce of, of of seven different juices and a nine rum blend it all just sort of gets lost. Like my from my perspective, you know, uh, you know, it was like kind of a sweet spot. Like six six ingredients, you can like each ingredient can play its role, and you can tell what it's doing. And you can enjoy it. And you can create something really harmonized, you know, and it could be three ingredients, like a daiquiri is a, a beautifully made daiquiri it could be wonderful. Or, you know, sometimes a nine ingredient drink is, is also amazing. But like I said, most of the time when you start seeing like, oh, I used, you know, five different rums in this one. I'm like, I, you know, I can't tell any of them. I can taste it. I can't tell you any of them. There's no distinct. <clears throat> so in that regard, I would say, um, if you look at enough to mention maximum Tiki, it just doesn't make sense. And sort of, can you do it? Yeah. Just, you know, users are like, yes, you know, like I can do dumb things, but <laughs> it doesn't mean it's a good idea. Um, if you, if you take maximum Tiki to mean, um, super crazy exotic ingredients, you know, so maybe you make the most, you know, awesome, uh, I've used this sort of like, uh, uh, uh pine nut, Oh yeah, things like barrel, yeah, barrel, like barrel aged banana foam, <laughs> type of stuff, or pine nut infused fat washed orgeat or something like that. These crazy ingredients. These sort of like, if you want to go that route, if you want to make it, and if it tastes good, by all means, go for it. Um, if if you can if you can make it, you can make it reliable and it tastes good and it's fun. By all means, uh, if you do all this crazy stuff and you're like, I don't know, I could have just used coconut cream or something like that, like. Again, like just because I can doesn't mean I want to. 
So, um, you know, and, and, and I said, and I know, you know, it's funny, like I, I'm part of a, of a group of people here in New Orleans, a little club of, of, of guys who, and you know, women can play too in there, um, but for mostly guys and, you know, they like, like every couple of weeks we, you know, get together and somebody does a presentation on a particular drink and they make the drink and they, and they sort of have, because they're doing it for other people who love the stuff, they'll go all out with the garnishes and whatever. And I'm like, that's awesome. You know, like the garnish where it's like a, a pineapple cut into quadrants. And so it looks like the tail of a parrot or whatever. <clears throat> and I'm like, that's awesome. You know, that's, that's kind of maximalist TV in that regard. Like you've gone over the top of the garnishes. Great. And I support it. Um, I don't, I don't know that I'll ever write a Max Mostiki book. <laughs> it's just sort of like, like, or like, just because you can doesn't mean it's, it's better than just making, you know, and, and, and the thing about, you know, I'll use this opportunity to clarify is the point of Max Mostiki or Minimal Mostiki. Some people have, you know, said like, oh, you know, it's like, you know, that, that you know, minimal tiki is like pog juice and rum. You know, it's not minimal tiki was never about like you should only make ingredients or tiki drinks with four recipes or four ingredients. It was never that. It was literally just like I want to get you going. Like tiki is intimidating, it's overwhelming. You think like where do I start? I don't have all these things. And I'm going like I'm going to give you. I'm going to try to present to you as a things you should buy first, things you should acquire first, things to focus on first. And it's funny, like I'm not, you know, like, you know, if you look at the chart that's in this book, and it's got like four juices and six types of rums and four types of syrups. And the other thing, you're like, it's like 30 ingredients in there. I'm not going to tell you that that's a small working set. I'm not. But I'm going to say like, start with these 30 instead of trying to worry about the 200. Like, look, start here learn, figure out if you like this stuff, enjoy it with this, and then by all means, go nuts. Look, look behind me. I don't, <laughs> I have, I have more than six bottles of rum and that's fine. That's because I'm like, I enjoy this and I decided to go down that path and I, you know, I can do this, but I'm saying you don't have to do this. You don't have to have this to enjoy a bunch of classic tea cocktails. So I'm just saying like, Start here. I'm sort of giving you the, the hard one wisdom of like me who went out and bought, you know, macadamia nut decor. Like, what am I going to use this in? I'm like, oh, that one drink. And now it's on the shelf and I've never touched it since. So it's, yeah, it's just sort of like, like, do this. Don't worry as much about that. That's all it is. That's all minimalist tiki is supposed to be. Yeah, it's interesting because there's, I, I've read online people that are somewhat older than me that have reviewed your book and said like, oh, like this is amazing. This is what I wish existed when I was just getting into this and it was all, you know, confusing. And it's interesting being on the somewhat younger side because this resource does exist by the time that I'm just getting into it. And it's like, wow, this is like so helpful. It's very like, it's just like a very nice like ramping into the things that are interesting. So I'm a huge fan of it. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of my, I, you know, like at Microsoft, somebody would you know, talk about like the superpower. What is your superpower? You know, what thing you do well? And for me, it's like it's sort of taking, seems to be taking large topics or complex topics and saying like, here's the core, here's the essence, start here. I'll understand it like this and then build. But, but yeah, so Minimal CT is very much in that, that sort of what I like to do. I'm like, okay, I learned the hard way and I'm going to try to convey some, you know, a little bit of wisdom for whatever that's worth. Yeah, I, I found it personally super helpful. And yeah, the maximalist tiki thing, may, maybe a better word be would be like optimalist tiki or something. I'm not sure. There's plenty of room. Maybe someday we'll do we'll do a revised version or something like that. But it's just, it's just really sort of like there's really nothing out there. I mean, I, I love Jeff's books. I love Mark Kate's books. I love them. It's like I saw an opportunity for for um, something that I didn't see that was really out there. And uh, it's funny. It was my wife who, uh, who sort of kicked me to do it because I, I wanted to go do something else. <laughs> We're at work or kind of something else. But she said, if you don't write this book, somebody else is going to. And then you're going to be really pissed off when somebody else does it. It looks like a great decision in hindsight. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. yeah it, it, it certainly sold more than we ever expected. At least, at least more than my wife ever expected. So. <laughs> <laughs>
I knew that there were a lot of PT people out there who who would love something like this. So, just out of curiosity, what do you um, like? Do you individ- Do you like mail out these books yourself? Yeah, yeah. We uh, yeah. There's, basically, it's the only self distribution is the only sort of only way to retain <laughs> retain any sort of reasonable profit margin. You know, we've we've looked at it from the perspective of of uh, you know selling versus Amazon or online retailers. Uh, we and 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 fulfillment centers and, and reality is like it's sort of like you know if you, if you want to actually make money at this short of short of selling you know hundreds of thousand copies you kind of have to own the entire the entire chain so right well so how did you figure out where to get because the actual book itself yeah I brought it along the the book itself is 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 it's beautiful like Thank the heart that's a nice hardcover the pictures are stunning the pages feel nice like it is i have like several hundred books you know okay in college a long time like what a surprise but like how, was that difficult to get it made the way that you like it uh actually no not at all um so we so this is this is um the brief version of the story is we were, when we were first looking at self-publishing we we were uh, we were like, oh, print on demand. And my wife, who used to work in publishing, you know, decades ago, was like, no, it's not going to work. work. Long story short, uh, there was a bourbon writer, a famous bourbon writer, uh, Chuck Cowdery, who said, like, look at a print broker. And we were like, well, was, was, okay, what's a print broker? And it turns out there was one who was actually very close to us. And they basically, uh, they are essentially intermediaries between people, self-publishers and the actual big commercial printing presses that, you know, like a like professional views. So, uh, you know, like, like if you go to a restaurant, I'm like, I'm like, oh, they have their own book and they sell it at the restaurant and it's a beautiful hardbound book, probably through a print broker. <laughs> so this is actually printed in South Korea. Um, and, you know, we picked paperweight, you know, the cover, like we literally specify everything exactly to what we want. And we're like, okay, we have, I mean, not that we don't have a budget, but we're like, we want this to be awesome and, and look just as good as any other top quality book out there. So, you know, it costs us more to print it than, you know, a paperback, but, you know, customers love that. So. The Smuggler's Cove book is also like really high quality in terms of like mm-hmm. hardcover and just the, the specific paper they use. Um, I guess it kind of makes sense. I don't know. People that care about what they drink and care about their cocktails. Yeah. I mean, I mean reality is the sort of, is like, we, we, you know, we want it to be a premium product. It's not a, it's not a, you know, it's not about hitting a $12 price point. It's about, you know, in, in this case, we know the Tiki crowd and, and they are not afraid to spend money on quality goods. And we're like, well, so let's give them quality goods. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So a couple more cocktail questions. There's a trend recently of companies making zero proof cocktails. So I'm not sure exactly, but different tasting ingredients that have no alcohol in them. What are your thoughts on this as it pertains to tiki cocktails? I mean, I think it's great. I think that um, that tiki should be inclusive of people who can't drink or don't want to drink or or what have you. And I think <clears throat> there's, I think more so in tiki than with other cocktail styles, there is opportunity to do amazing no ABV cocktail, low ABV or no ABV cocktails. Uh, I mean the ingredient. I mean the the palette that Tiki has to work with. Um, you know, the it's a, I, I love I love watching a bar when to see when somebody asks for an, for a non alcoholic Tiki drink. I love seeing what they do, and I can you know not, rarely does it surprise me what they do, but I still love to see like how they think about it. But you know it comes back to that the same you know it's the pattern of the sweet and sour. You know it's, it's usually. Some types of cool juices, you know, pineapple juice or guava juice or whatever, and like lemons or limes, uh, passion fruit. Um, if you can syrup, if you can take a tiny bit of alcohol, uh, like Angostura bitters. I mean, literally, you know, like, I mean, believe it or not, my 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 during the day drink when I'm just sort of sitting here doing work. Um, I will just grab a big old, big old uh, cup of crushed ice and um, like heavy five dashes of heavy dashes of Angostura bitters and uh, pineapple juice, fresh squeezed pineapple juice. Pour that over there and like pineapple juice and Angostura together. Lovely. I'll drink that all day. Uh, I can also, you know, blend a little bit with um, carbonated water to sort of give it a little bit of a, like acidic edge, you know, a little tartness to it. Um, there's all sorts of fun things you can do to make no EBV cocktails that are that are that taste good or interesting. Use spices, you know, 
cinnamon syrup is you know, I think that's great that um, that people can participate in it without having to you know have, you know, have you know, three ounces of proof rum right <laughs> yeah yeah it's um I think it can be additive not you know not it's not a zero sum game so the people that want to drink alcohol can uh, and those who don't you know don't I think that's fine Um there is, from a chemistry perspective, you know, there's just simply some compounds that you're able to dissolve with alcohol that you, you know, can't with just water. Um, but I don't think that there's any risk of that. Yeah, I mean, like I said, Angus for Angus for bitters is amazing. Uh, yeah, tiny, I mean, it's it's forty four or forty seven percent alcohol, but you know, usually a dash. Most most people are like, oh, that's you know, it's fine. So much flavor packed into that, and you can do non alcoholic bitters as well, but. Like Angostura is just so damn good. From your book, I grabbed the recipe for an Angostura colada. Yeah, I still get like I, I at some point wrote an article, like basically an article like yes, Angostura bitters can be a base spirit. It's strong enough, you know. And people are like, oh yeah, You're like no, it's it's awesome. There's like four, there's like four recipes in the book that have uh, at least half an ounce of Angostura bitters. Um, and like I said, the trick the trick is to to uh, figure something that was sort of like oppose that extreme bitterness, and usually, you know, like orgeat and coconut cream are the two sort of ones that work, 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 work well at that. I was concerned. I had no idea what to expect, but it was really a delightful drink. Yeah. And it's also, it's also a lot of, so many objections. Like, I have a four ounce bottle of Angostura bitters, so I'm going to use this. <laughs> like, no, you buy the big 16 ounce bottles. I, I literally have several bottles. Like, I, I keep three or four 16 ounce bottles of it on hand. So. And no, they're not paying me to promote it. <laughs> okay. Um, so another cocktail question. Tiki is known to be like very, um, you know, it's, it's very high on the glassware and presentation and garnishes. There's a trend, another trend recently, especially, you know, accelerated due to COVID of companies selling canned cocktails. Um, and I recently saw that Rumba in Seattle is selling a few let me see. They have a Mai Tai, uh, an Old Fashioned, uh, and a couple others that they sell, that they sell, are selling in cans. Um, what are your thoughts on canned cocktails with tiki? I don't know. It's it's uh, something like I've tried relatively few of them. Surprisingly, uh, my wife is actually has actually uh, drank more than I have, and it's usually like I'm going to a to a, like here in New Orleans we can carry around open containers, but. Um, okay. Um, but, uh, you know, or she's going to a show or sort of like out on the lawn type of thing. But, um, I, I myself haven't like actively sought them out. Like I know they're a big thing and I know good bars that I respect are doing them. I just have, um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I'm just a purist, but you know, like, like every night around seven o'clock, I just want to wander out there and go like, what calls to me and make it, <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't seem like, like cheating to you know, just grab it and out of the freezer. So, but I'm also not like a big beer drinker either. Like I can enjoy it, but it's like I was just like, I have all these ingredients and all these rums and all these spirits and use them. So I don't like I said I don't go into the RTD space uh, at all really. But, but I but I respect people who are doing it and think it's great, especially as a way of uh, like Rumba of like creating revenue streams that uh, didn't exist before. Right. Absolutely. I think I, I see it as, you know, I, I find what's the difference between cocktails and beer is that cocktails you can finely tune to be exactly and precisely whatever you want. And uh, I mentioned to you, it's, it's kind of combinatorically interesting of if you have what's if you have six bottles, then you have 720 drinks you can make. And it's like, that's, you know, that's crazy. Or you have more than that. Um, and if I wanted a can of alcohol, I would, you know, probably grab a beer. But I think that's a good point that you know, secondary revenue stream. Uh, there's people that, you know, or there's places you don't have open carry, so you just have to get it, you know, a beer can delivered or the spirit can delivered. Um, yeah, it's, I've only seen it done poorly. I'm not lucky enough to live close to Rumba and um, everywhere around me just has like nasty, like whiskey mixed with lemonade in a can. And it's, that's not great, but I can see it. If it was done well, it would be interesting. Um, so another kind of, mm, future slash techie question there's a distillery named lost spirits that you've wrote about a few times on your blog 
quick overview, they develop some kind of reactor that brings the, um, a tw you know, for normal spirits, it takes 20 years to age, or mm, to phrase it differently, you take a distilled spirit, you age it for 20 years, and you have a nice product at the end. Lost Spirits has found a way to take this process from 20 years down to roughly a week. Um, I saw you post about this back in 2016, 2017 or so, and I haven't seen too many updates. Do you know where that process stands? Yeah. So, um, you know, full disclosure, Brian, Brian Davis and Brian and Joanne uh, Haruda are good friends of mine. Um, uh, I haven't talked with them that much recently just because all of us have been super busy with our stuff but um but yeah brian um brian's and brian's an interesting character i love chatting with him he is one of the most uh, <laughs> uh people that i love just like watching his brain work um there are stories that i probably shouldn't re repeat here but you're like, <laughs> like i'm not even in your league for coming out with like crazy ideas like he does um um <clears throat> but the the short, answer, the short answer to what they're doing is essentially, um, uh, you know, Lost Spirits is still out there. They're still they're still making rum. They they sort of, they, they're sort of like this story of like it just so happens that like every two years they like need to up and move somewhere else or something happens. So uh, like I first saw them in their their Salinas story, which was literally amongst the artist show fields, um, and and they like had basically had to like rebuild his, his crazy story where they had to like rebuild his first dra create his new first his first metal dragon still because his previous wooden still had gotten contaminated because their swimming pool that they use as their cooling pond uh or still created a leak and leaked the soil and created tca like it's like crazy factors <laughs> it's like <clears throat> you can't make up stories that are that are better than what actually happens to brian but um <laughs> So I met them in, in, in the Salinas story, and then uh, at some point they basically announced that they were going to be licensing uh, this aging technology, which I can explain a tiny bit about. They are licensing it to other distilleries, uh, and then they ended up moving to, in partnership with two other companies, to um, uh, North Carolina. Uh, that lasted a couple months, and then stuff happened so they moved back to la <clears throat> um and in la they had um a story there where you literally floated down a down a uh it was basically their their cooling pond but you basically it was in the pitch dark and you were on a boat and you floated down this cooling pond not knowing what was going on around you but when you lights came up you were there now on the island of dr moreau um they very much like brian <clears throat> Brian basically wants to build amusement parks that also have new distilleries. Um, and anyhow, so we went there and then that distillery had a fire. And so they moved to another distillery elsewhere in LA where, but they couldn't really host visitors there. So there was, it was a two part distillery where you rode in, in buses that were basically mobile immersion suites. So you couldn't actually see where you were going anywhere. You were just immersed in these, in um these buses that like one was like themed like a russian submarine like it's just crazy stuff <clears throat> where you arrived at the distillery and then like you would ride in the choo choo train around the reactor uh he is he's like extremely theatric and then COVID hit and so i don't know if there's i don't remember if they're operating the same la distillery now but they then got money and now have an even bigger distillery in las vegas <laughs> Uh, which is now part of, I think it's like Area 15. It's part of this like high money entertainment complex. Um, so they have a new story there, which we have not been now to yet to see. But basically, um, I guess it, basically Brian builds builds um, amusement park like experiences that also happen to have the story. And they're selling, you know, and they're still they're still making rum. They were also uh, they did actually did a really interesting uh, Isla whiskey, or basically buying not quite legally aged, you know, minimum, not quite reaching the minimum age to be called like a single malt scotch whiskey from Isla. Basically buying that, each thousand reactors. Uh, that was quite good. Uh, one one awards for that. Uh, so basically, Brian, Brian is still out there, he's still doing his stuff, he's still tinkering with the technology, uh, but the, he's not 
pressing super hard to have it be nationwide distribution. Like he has no problem selling it out in, in California and now Nevada. So um, he's still, he's still doing the thing. He's still fingering the process and they've, you know, created technology to simulate the angel share <clears throat> as part of the aging process. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I know a bit about the, a bit about the, the process and, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say it makes an identical clone of 20 years aging, but it's, it's amazing for like scientific research to sort of get us towards that goal to where we understand what do we need to do? You know, sort of, it's something imperfect, but then you iterate, keep, okay, now what's, okay, now what's the biggest hurdle? You go fix that. And so, and, and Brian just sort of relentlessly keeps doing that. So. Yes. I was reading a bit about this reactor and so it's, they are organic chemistry reactions and my understanding, so organic chemistry reactions have great constants associated with them, depending on temperatures and pressures and various environmental factors. And in a barrel, you know, the rate constant is such that you need to leave it for like 20 years or so at the temperature and pressure and conditions. And my understanding is that this reactor basically plays with the environment to increase that rate constant, kind of cat, cal, catalysize the reaction. Is that what's yeah. going on? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's essentially, essentially it's, it's imparting more energy to speed up reactions. Um, that energy can be, can be as a, as I understand it and his patents out there, if you want to read it. <coughs> um, but, um, the liquid is, is, um, warm. So there's more heat energy. Um, you know, think about like barrel aging tribune is warmer, ages, ages faster. Um, so liquid is warm, uh, also, um, blasted by light and the light is not, you know, like light of particular frequency or frequencies, uh, in particular directions, whatever. Um, but it's not, I don't think the light is so much for the spirit itself, but the wood in there, there's literally, they take pieces of, of oak, char them just like as if they're in a barrel and those basically sit in a cylinder inside and so that that or basically inside of the spirit uh, in the middle that light basically decomposes the wood faster than it would <clears throat> ordinarily i think brian once said that he was inspired by the fact that you know they had a deck at their distillery in salinas and the deck it was an old deck and basically light damage basically being direct sunlight basically caused the wood to decompose and if you know sort of like Sort of like, oh, gave him the idea of like, what, what if we try to make that even go even faster? So, <clears throat> you know, it's actually, you know, it's much more complicated than all that. But um, like I said, it, it um, different spirits seem to respond differently to it. I think some of the rise, the early rise that was made um, were actually pretty good. I think that the, um, the Isla whiskey that comes out is pretty good. Um, the Certainly the, the Jamaican rum um, certainly bears some some uh I, you can imagine smith and cross being aged a little longer um uh so yeah it's like i said i'm i'm there are there are people who will criticize him for like it's not actually 20 years exactly of aging but i'm saying like no he's he's pushing the boundaries and you know like nobody built the perfect 747 the first time either you iterate okay and you had mentioned that there was some technology to simulate the angel share why would you want to do this? I thought that this just results in a lower yield. So the the angel share is not it's not just about losing, you know, losing alcohol or water. Um, there's also, um, for example, the angel share uh, basically a lot. The while, while things are escaping out of the barrel, there's more uh, oxygen and other gases come into the barrel. So it's sort of like reintroduces oxygen into an environment that might have been depleted of oxygen. So, and I'm, I'm not an organic chemist, but this is my sort of like vaguely no science guy's explanation, but essentially, um, yeah, there's, and, and, and it's not, you know, among other things, it's not like alcohol and water are being, are being, um, extracted at the same rate. Um, as well, if you think about the angel share, um, 
it's not just alcohol and water that are evaporating, so the other organic compounds, and so the lighter organic, lighter, smaller organic compounds are going to evaporate, get through the barrel walls faster than the heavier compounds. And so my, my understanding is, for example, um, is aldehyde is a light compound that doesn't taste particularly good, um, but you, know, you can have plenty of it in your distilled rum, but when you put it in a barrel, it's be the first thing to go, go off. And so it will mellow out by letting these sort of lighter, less pleasant compounds evaporate. They're going to evaporate faster than the other or get heavier compounds, uh, which aren't going to evaporate through or much slower. And so I sort of barrel aging gives a little more weight. It is going to tend to, to effectively concentrate the heavier compounds that can't escape. So I said, angel, angel share is like everything in aging is far more complicated than I can completely understand, but um, there's, there's a lot of moving parts. Okay. Got it. Um, another spirit tech question. There was a company or a startup that recently announced it's called air vodka. And the idea is it takes carbon dioxide, puts it through a chemical process to get um, ethanol. And, you know, well, you know, here's your perfect vodka because you just mix that with water and it's like, okay, great. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say that that's great, but you could imagine kind of the next step beyond that of having some lab somewhere that has, you know, as pure as you can get of ethyl acetate and, you know, all your other esters and aldehydes and just figuring out how to perfectly combine the ratios so you end up with you know, a 30 year old, a 30 year aged rum that's just coming out of the laboratory. Right. What would you think about this? I think it is as a, you know, I think it comes, you know, if you think about, I forget the, the scientific uh, or the physics name for it, but if you think about that, if you, if you knew the exact position and velocity of every particle in the universe, you could completely predict the future. I'm sure you can tell me what that is, what it's called, but it's that idea with if we have sufficient granularity then yes we can we can recreate or simulate something if, with an appropriate level of fidelity that it is indistinguishable from the 30 year rum of whiskey or whatever you know the the trick is that for all the science we have and for all the amazing gcms and all that kind of stuff um we're still not at that, at my understanding is we're still not at that resolution and, and uh, ability to concoct exact, the exact compounds and the exact ratios. We still don't have the granularity necessary to create that. Like our, our, our noses and our tongues are more, still more, uh, more fine grained than what the best you know, GCMS data can give us. And so, you know, it's sort of like you don't know how much is tiny. It was one element that may be in very small quantity, but is actually impacting the flavor or this element in conjunction with another element, create a third flavor. Um, but that they seem like, well, it's, you know, 0.001% of it. But if that's the one just that flavor, then it matters. And so, you know, you know, I, I sort of think of it as like, um, uh, like, Fast Fourier transforms, which I haven't really thought about in 30 years, but it's that notion of like any any sort of waveform can ultimately be decomposed into some period or some some ratio and number of sine waves and whatever. Or like, well, when we get the right granularity for that, yes, we can we can recreate that that wave exactly. But uh, you know, I don't feel like at this point we're at that level yet. Will we be there in 10 years? I don't know. You know, like I said, as a theoretical question, I believe it's absolutely possible. As a practical question, I don't know that we're anywhere close to that yet. Yeah, I remember, and I only got into the very beginnings of it, but for example, in my under organic chemistry classes, I went into it with the notion of like, yeah, well, you know, it's just, you just synthesize things and it's very easy and, you know, it's perfect. And in reality, it's like, it's such a mess. And like your yields are like in the, like this, like sub percent level for a number of reactions. And like, everything is like, well, you know, it's just dominated by, you know, your rate constants or you have equilibrium where you just can't push reactions all the way through, or, or you have to go to some extremely high temperature. And it's like, chemistry is hard. Like physics is just, 
That's why I got into physics. It's like, you know, it's straightforward. Exactly. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a far simpler. I said, this is how I got, got in, why I got out of physics and programming is because like, at least in programming, it's possible for you to understand the entire world that you, like we designed the chip. So we know exactly what the instructions are. We know exactly how they operate and, and putting aside, you know, stray neutrons or whatever flipping a bit somewhere within that realm we can literally understand everything we can can actually predict the future because there's no randomness in that and um but yeah as said physics is sort of like every you know every time you learn something like ah but this is just a simplified model of something more complicated and and sort of like programming is like this is a convenient off-ramp that happened, happened to do very well for me but yeah, I guess I still think of a scientist that way. It's like, yes, conceptually, it's just it's just a it's a it's a you know it's an organic solution in equilibrium. But like I said, go back and look at the like the research papers on rum flavors. You're like, oh, there's like 370 different identified compounds, and we don't know it's not listed there. You know, it's not like to pick the five, top five. It's like the the, the long tail matters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the long tail, it's like you understand 95% of it, but the 5% is the part that is the most important. Yeah, a lot of my life is long tail type stuff. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so looking forward broadly, where do you see the worlds of rum and also tiki going in the next three to five to ten years? Oh, oh I hate these type of questions. <laughs> no, 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 I hate them because you're like, you know, you know, when you look back at what happened five years ago, it seems obvious, but looking forward is um, I can tell you what I would like to see. I would like to see um, rum continue to elevate. Like I, at this moment in my life, I can imagine me spending decades helping to try to elevate rum to get it to that point where it's regarded as multiple distinct spirits, each with their own um quality and tradition uh as what we consider the top bourbon scotch whiskey whatever um, so i would like to good see continue to see rum elevate um, you see strong signs of this already in that suddenly the the number of rums we have good unique different rums we have available now is compared to five years ago it just blows my mind the fact that you know five years ago i thought Oh, well, maybe if I'm lucky someday, I'll get to try a sample from like of Hampton Dock, you know, that high ester Jamaican. I'll get to try a sample of this from Ian A. Shear. Uh, and then, you know, at some point they sent me a small sample and I was like ecstatic. And I was like, okay, I've reached a pinnacle of like, this is like, can't be more insider. And now there's like five different versions of it for sale. Some of them age, you know, like, just what what you know the independent bottlers um what they're putting out there and they're seeking out new things and interesting blends and single you know single distillation stuff um so it was um, unimaginable 10 years ago that these would now be available so you know, i see that as a good sign i see this is this is um continues in that direction and that you know we will overcome the sort of perception you know, amongst, you know, the general population and store owners that like, well, whiskey's where all the money is. So we're going to stock Bacardi and Captain Morgan and that's all they need. So working past that, um, in terms of Tiki, <clears throat> um, you know, I think, you know, I think we're in a, in a new golden age in that, um, you know, the palette of ingredients we use is, uh, expanded substantially. Uh, I actually have done the analysis. I've done like the minimalist tiki ingredient analysis, but on the full set of 130 recipes. So I have that data. It's interesting to see like what has, what has popped up is sort of like a, a common ingredient now. Um, I think I, I worry sometimes that maybe it's you know, people, uh, some bars or restaurants are trying to jump on the bandwagon without being fully respectful or aware of what the traditions are it's sort of like tiki's hot now so open a tiki bar um and sort of like solely its reputation is sort of in the somewhat same way i don't i don't want to repeat of what happened in the 70s where it just sort of like 
goes to crap and everybody's doing it and it just becomes so common that nobody nobody bothers with it anymore you know so I, I, you know it's a, i don't want to call it gatekeeping but i want i want you know i would like to see i you know i think more tiki bars are great but i want them to be you know in that craft mold and that genuine about it and um i don't know i i you know, sometimes sometimes I worry about you know permutations and combinations. It's like, I'm like, all right, we got this set of ingredients, and you know, how many permutations, combinations, even with an expanded set, how many different unique combinations are there that are at the end of the day fundamentally different from something else? You know, I can, you know, make make a recipe, and I'm like, oh, I swapped a Demerara rum for a Saint Lucia rum. You know, it's a really a different recipe. You know, it sort of sort of worries or like you know, how will we? How will we? You know, is there new things we can bring to the mix to take it in a different direction? Um, I, mean, I don't know. It's a, it's a it's a it's an interesting question. I don't know what the answer you're looking for, but that's sort of that's sort of you know that that's what's on my mind when I think about you know Tiki five years out. It's like like don't don't ruin the golden era we have, and also how do we how do we continue to evolve it without you know super crazy stuff? You know, you know, molecular mixology is cool, but it's, I don't know that every bar is gonna gonna go down that path either. Yeah, well, something at least in my experience that's fun is going to a nice bar and getting a great drink and then going home and trying to figure out exactly what it was that they did. And that's a little bit impossible. If you go to the aviary, it's like, yeah, you're not going to do that. Yeah, no, yeah, like, uh, you know, yeah, exactly. But like I said, I want to go there just to see what they did with it. Oh, no, I'm like, tell me about this. Yeah, I, lo I love that. I just don't know that I'm going to do it at home. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. Um, this is a great kind of hedge question on my part, which is, is there anything that I should have asked you but didn't? And if so, what is the answer to that question? I, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you kind of a lame answer, but the, uh, um, the head question could have asked me is like, what's next? And um, we're not ready to reveal it uh, just, just yet. But uh, if you look over my career of what I've done, at different books and different projects and whatever, um, do it shortly probably be able to share the by far the biggest thing I've ever done. Um, and yes, I think it's going to be, it will be a, uh, I, I hope, fingers crossed, it will be a seminal work that will uh, help transform, uh, help transform things in a, in a very positive way. So uh, what, what is this? Is, this? is this for rum or is this for spirits? Can you give me any can't direction? Say just yet, but it's been three okay. years and um Three years and um, everything I've done so far is sort of sort of like a uh, an introductory chapter to to what this is. So yeah. So, w uh, would you say that up until now, minimalist tiki is your biggest kind of work? Um, for cocktail, yeah. I mean, for cocktail, yeah. Um, certainly, if you look at minimalist tiki versus the amount of effort that we needed to do to do minimalist tiki versus the amount of effort to write Windows ninety five system programming secrets. Windows 95 system programming secrets took a lot longer. It was a lot more, a lot more um, uh, effort. Uh, but this new project has forced forced me to learn new skills and manage new software techniques. And and uh, uh, so yeah, it's uh, it will it will both it will both be unsurprising, but also very surprising when you see the scale of it. So wow, is there any kind of rough timeline you might want to give, or just completely? Um blank for now lord help me it better be out by the end of the year so end of the year okay yeah it's just it's just a matter of uh buttoning up the last little you know it's <clears throat> it exists i could show people but it's just not ready to be there, there's a few more steps that need to happen so okay well god i can't wait until the end of the year then um me too i'll put all of your relevant links in the description but I think that your cocktail wonk on most um, sites, I think your rum wonk also on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, right. It's yeah. and I'm probably, I'm probably going to start a sub stack soon as well. But uh, uh, yeah, so but I'm just not, I'm not going to point anybody there yet. Well, there's, well, there's really nothing, no content there, but yeah, sort of um, 
we sort of, you know, during this project, I've also needed like, okay, rethink how how I share information and and you know, sure, basically try to be maybe a little leaner, but also more periodic uh, in my in what I say. There's so many so many things that I come across. I'm like, oh, I'd like to share something about this, but you're like. A, I have so much other th and so many other things taking up my time that I can't do this properly, you know, properly in the context walk, in the cocktail walk form, uh, and and yeah, so it's sort of like approach Substack from like a with this the same you know the same topics I love but with a sort of a sort of a new approach to writing. I'm hoping. Yeah, I, I'm excited to hear more about all those things and, and find them online. Um, I think I should probably let you get going. We talked for yeah, right close to three hours. Um, there you go. I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk with me. It was no, this was fun. I, I appreciate you reaching out and and including me with people far smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, it's it's certainly a different interest, but I don't know. There's a lot of things that are all interesting and people generally to be, you know, rather siloed. And I don't see much of a point in that. I mean, God, you started out as a physicist and a software person, and now look at you. I just, it just seems unwise to silo yourself. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, yeah. The, the skill, the skills from the sciences and, and, uh, and practical engineering are applicable to fun things as well. So I'm just sort of like one of the people who's like, I'm going to take a leap and try to make this happen as my career. So, 